Hey, hello everyone. This is Criminal Profiler Pat Brown, and today I'm doing a really, really fascinating show on the um, the murder of Greg Whitman. Um, I actually worked this case, so this one is personal to me, uh, and I did have access to all the police reports and the autopsy photos and the crime scene photos. And mm, this was a little 13 year old boy who was brutally stabbed to death. And it's one of those that hits home because it's a child. Um, let me just quickly, before we start, I just wanna explain just the basics of the case. Um, Greg Whitman was 13 years old. He was stabbed to death on uh, October 2nd, 1998. Um, after arriving home from school, his brother, Zach Whitman, who was 15 at the time, was arrested and charged with a crime and convicted, and he spent over 20 years in prison. And in uh, somewhere around uh, close to before his parole date, uh, he got paroled in uh, 2019, May of 2019. And, and he was 36 years old at the time. Prior to that, he had confessed to the crime uh, not, not in the beginning, but just, just, you know, before the parole day came up, he confessed to it in a plea bargain. And the claim was he never heard he could have had this plea bargain before his family thinks, and many people think he just did this because he had an opportunity because he was a, he was a, um, he was a juvenile at the time. He had an opportunity to get out of prison, you know, at some point in his life and not have to be in prison, uh, for his entire life. So he was willing to take this plea deal. Okay, fine. I'll confess just to get out, which he did. And then they let him out. So many believe that he only confessed so he could have some of his life back. His parents definitely believe that. So this is what the, um, oh, that's, and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Christine, for saying you could hear and see me. I always ask this question and I just wanted to tell people what the show is about before I ask that question, but I'm glad you can do that because sometimes it doesn't go so well. <clears throat> with the video or audio. So awesome. Thank you for telling me. Um, so what happened here is that he, he is out of prison. Uh, Zach is out of prison. And there was a show made called The Whitmans. Um, it was also called The Murder of uh, Greg's, uh, Greg uh, Whitman. It, there's a lot of names for this. But <laughs> this one show that was done, it's on Investigation Discovery. And the link is below. So you can click on it and do watch it. It's a fascinating show, mostly about the Whitmans. Those are the parents, the dad, and the mom. Um, and they're explaining what happened. And they're explaining how they've always believed in their son, which is Zach Whitman. This is him at the time of the crime. This is him. Oops, they go this way. Now, um, they always believed in their son. So they're explaining how what happened from their point of view and how the crime they think went down. Uh, they think a stranger did this. They don't think it was uh, Zach and they've always supported him. And now he's out of prison and he's come home. So it's a very fascinating show. And so I suggest everybody, you know, watches that show. So, um, okay. So before I go for, uh, further, I just want to say that I'm going to do a reenactment of this crime which probably gets me demonetized. I love the things that get me demonetized, but probably will that. Um, but I, I have to do this reenactment because there's an issue of whether there was enough time for Zach to commit this crime um, and a lot of argument over that. So I want to do a reenactment so that you can see whether it's possible or it's not possible. And so if you hang in a little bit, uh, first I'm going to explain the crime scene to you because I have the uh, crime scene uh, sketches. And so I'm not going to show those crime scene photos except a couple. I'll show a couple that aren't horribly gruesome, um, but I won't show anything with poor, poor little uh, Greg in them. Um, I'm just going to show a couple because they help you understand how it went down. Uh, and then I'm going to do the reenactment and I'm going to time it. So I'm going to be running through my house um, reenacting this, this particular scenario because it's very interesting. Crime scene reenactments aren't done enough you know, especially by people who aren't involved in cases, they talk about them, but they don't actually know how they went down. And I've done a lot of crime scene reenactments uh, whenever I've gotten a case that I've worked personally. Uh, I've done some pretty interesting things, <laughs> hung myself in the bathroom. Uh, one day, I think I had my daughter <laughs> in her bedroom and I said, she was on the phone with her friend. And I'm like, I'm like, excuse me, could, just, could you just stay, stay in that position, would you? <laughs> and she's like, mom stabbing me. <laughs> she was a teen and had a good sense of humor. <clears throat> and um, 
you know, so I've done these reenactments. Um, one time I stopped a gentleman uh, as he was coming into the parking lot uh, to his car because I saw this car that was used, this kind of car, this exact car was used in a crime. And what I wanted to know was, would the victim fit in the in the uh, the trunk of the car? If you're in UK, the boot. Uh, so I waited because I saw his his um, uh, you know, he had, he had put money in the meter back in those days, you know, when you put money in meters and there was like no time left. So I thought this guy's going to come out. And he did. He came to the car and I said, excuse me, sir, can you just do me a favor? Could you just open your trunk for me? <laughs> you know, I'm a criminal profiler working on a case and this is the kind of car that was used. And I just would like to look and see how big the trunk is. And so he opened up the trunk and I went, wow, she ain't going to fit in there. <laughs> so, so very interesting when you do a crime scene reenactment because you find out things that you wouldn't know if you didn't do that. So hang around for the crime reenactment. It's going to be really interesting. I promise you that. So, yes. So anyway, before I continue, I do want to do my due diligence because I my I would like my my <laughs> my channel to keep going in spite of the demonetization right here in the middle. Please subscribe. If you're sitting here now and you're watching this, please subscribe. Um, it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to cost you anything, but man, does it make a difference in how the algorithms find my show and put it out there to the public. Um, so please do that. And please share it. If you're part of a true crime community, share this video because, you know, I, I do not participate in other Facebook pages or true crime pages because as a professional, I don't want to say I agree with ne necessarily the viewpoints here or the viewpoints there. Even if I do, I'm not going to try to, I'm, I try not to say that. So I don't post it any other place except for my Facebook page and my Twitter page, which you can also, you know, go to. Uh, so do share in your own communities um, and press the bell so you get notifications and do like this one. Also, you can join Patreon. Huge way. This is a huge support for me because since I'm being demonetized, if you join Patreon, this way, Patreon, um, even for a dollar a month that supports the channel. There are three levels of different things happening. And I'm going to be adding to those you know, as, as time goes on. Uh, but, you know, read what read about it and support the channel and buy my book. Hey, OK, there we go. That's enough. All right. So now on to what's really important here. All right. So this is these are the Whitmans. Um, and this is the sh you really should see this documentary because it really does show what the parents are going through. Um, these parents came to me, these two parents sat in my house, in my office, across my, across from me at my desk. And I, I, I was asked to review this case for the defense. Um, and it was very, very heartrending because these two people, these parents, they lost one of their sons to homicide and the other son was accused of the homicide. Can you imagine anything worse than that? And like li literally, I just have to say, my heart just rips for these two people because I can't think of anything worse. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's anything worse. It's, it's one thing to lose your child to murder, but it's another thing to have your other child accused of it. Um, and there are a lot of crimes like this, uh, you know, more crimes than we realize uh, where uh, one family member kills another family member or all of their family. We've seen some cases where uh, I did Bamber and Bane. If you look on my videos and you go to my playlist, guys, go to my playlist, <laughs> look under live shows or look under case cases, and you'll see all the cases I've done, which I think are about almost 40 now. And you can look and see what case you're interested in. Um, so go to those, those up on the top of the screen, you know, it says videos and playlists, hit those things and you'll find other cases that I've, I've done. And Bamber and Bain are two cases where uh, the two young men and the families killed their entire families. In my belief, they were both guilty of killing their entire families. Other people disagree, but I believe they did. So you have those that kill their entire families and then walk away. Um, you have sometimes a, a duo like brothers or brother and sister who kill the rest of their family and and try to get away with it. You, but you also sometimes get what's called fratricide, where basically one sibling kills another. And I'm not I'm say fratricide is brother killing brother. I always get confused on that. But anyway, um, one sibling kills another. And why does one sibling kill another? Usually, in my opinion, uh, from my experience, there's a level of jealousy 
that the one who is doing the killing feels that they have been, they're not getting the attention that the other sibling is getting, that that other sibling is the golden child, the one that is preferred by the parents, and therefore they do them in. Um, now, anybody who's been part of a family does know that their, their parents sometimes have preferences. This is, this is just a fact of life. Um, I was one of three uh, girls. Um, I have two sisters, two older sisters. <laughs> and I was that third child who I felt when I was growing up was that child that wasn't the golden child. <laughs> I was the ignored child. That's what I thought. Now, mind you, I was a kid and a teenager. Who knows? Now that I'm older, I have a lot different viewpoints on things. And here's what I think happened in my personal experience. My parents, my mother was uh, an ice capades. Um, she was in the ice capades. She was a skater. And so my she met my father at Rockefeller Center and they skated together and then got married. And my 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 oldest sister, they, they took her to the rink and she skated beautifully. And she actually did become a a, a, a competitive skater later in life. And then they gave her the Stanzioni boots, which if you know anything about sk skating, these were like the top boots you could get. And then after she had those boots, they passed them down to my middle sister. And then my middle sister used them and then they passed them down to me. By the time they got to me, they were so crappy that, they, that, that their ankles like were like weak and they fell over and, and, my, and I would go out and skate and my, my ankles would cave. And my mother would say, you have bad ankles. And it wasn't until I later in life or as a teenager that I went and got some cheap, uh, you know, boots, uh, skates that, you know, when you go to a skating rink, you know, and you just, you just rent the boots and they're like rocks. I'm like, dang, I can skate. <laughs> I'm like, mom, wh why did you make me wear, use those, those Stanzioni boots that were no good anymore? You know, and I'm thinking she should have known that they had become weak and therefore they wouldn't support my ankles. But anyway, you know, so anyway, my sister, she was a skater and, and she skated well, and, and she's a wonderful person. So I, my parents really, you know, I could see what they were like really into her because she skated with them. Then my second sister, the middle sister played the organ and my mother was into playing the organ. And my, my second sister started playing the organ and she played the organ in church and all this stuff. She became, I was like, Oh my God, you know, she's, they like her because she plays the organ. And then there was me and I was a weirdo. And, I'm, uh, and I admittedly was a weirdo. I wanted to do karate and bowling. And my parents were like, not into either one of those things. And it wasn't that they didn't want to support me. I just think they didn't relate. And so I felt like I was the unloved child. <laughs> no, I'm going to say my oldest sister probably thought certain things about her life. My middle sister thought th things about her life. And I was just a stupid teen who probably thought, hey, they don't like me as much as my older sisters. You know, who knows? You know, I mean, we're just, you know, sometimes we're just kids. And and I have a good relationship with both of my sisters today. They, they're great. Um, and my parents, I, 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 I they're, they've, they're, they're deceased now. And I totally appreciate all the efforts they put into raising me and my sisters. But, and so luckily I wasn't a psychopath, so <laughs> that helps. But I just want to point out that as a child grows up, they get viewpoints. And also it's, it's also terribly important that you understand that sometimes children, psychopaths develop very young in life. So they already feel some kind of detachment from their parents. And, and certain there's all kinds of things at play and they become that kind of person who isn't happy with life and has a rage at, at life. And often when they become teenagers, if they feel they are not the loved one, that the other child is the golden child, but they're ignored. If they're psychopathic, it can lead to disastrous you know, circumstances. I'm not going to say yet whether I think this is what happened here, but you know, this is what happens in certain uh, fratricides uh, that one of the children decides that if they could only get one of the, the, the one child decides if they could get rid of the other child, life would be better. Uh, we see this uh, with the Jean Bonnet killing. Um, a lot of people think it was a stranger. I do not. I believe that it was an internal family homicide. The question is, did the older brother have anything to do with what happened to his younger sister? Don't, I, I can't say, all I can say is it was internal to the house. Um, but this happens. I had another case in Virginia where the brother killed his sister. 
uh, because he just wanted her out of the way. And the family stood behind that brother who killed his sister and he was guilty as hell. So, but I, you know, I was brought into this case. The family, the, the parents were sitting in front of me and it was from the defense team. They're like, please, can you profile this case and, and tell us, could a stranger have done this and not our son? Not, not Zach. Zach, we do not believe Zach killed our child. And sometimes, you know, they're right. And so the question is, are they right or are they just parents who cannot accept the loss of both children, um, one to homicide and one to the just the criminal justice system and also believing that he's a homicidal maniac, you know? So uh, that killed their own son, you know, they killed his brother. I mean, uh, horrible case. Okay, so now, okay, I got to take off my sweater because I know I'm hot. All right. All right, now I'm going to move to the crime scene. Um, by the way, this is, this is, uh, this here is uh, Zach. This here is Greg. So they're two years apart. Um, I'll say Greg, you know, when I looked at the autopsy photos of Greg, he's a small boy. He's not a big boy. He's a really a small child. Um, so don't think of him as a tall, hulky 13 year old. Because sometimes as 13 year olds today, I'm like, what are you eating? <laughs> this was not one of those kids, small child. And this was his brother who was two years older and was is quite, quite much larger than him. So, you know, anyway, here is their home. Let's see the crime scene tape. This is their home. They lived in a lovely neighborhood. Uh, he, what happened that day was that the school bus came and now, now Zachary was supposedly staying home because he was ill. Now, I want to point out things about cases. People believe things. They'll say, oh, Zach was home because he was sick. We do not know that. Zach was home because he said he was sick. I don't know if he was sick. I, I know whether he's guilty or not. I don't know if he was sick. That's what he said. That's what the parents, the parents apparently allowed him to stay home. That's all I know. And then uh, it was clear that Greg went to school that day and he clear he was on the bus, clear he got off the bus. And this could be a really interesting point about when he got off the bus, when the bus arrived and when he arrived home. It's going to be very important later. So pay attention to that. So anyway, he got off the bus. He goes to his home. That's his front door. Zachary claims that he left the key to the house hanging on the front door. Um, again, we're talking about a claim. And one of the problems sometimes when you're not inside the case uh, is that you don't know whether he really left the key. Now, Zachary says he did. Um, the parents say he did, but we don't know if the parents are saying that's unusual or it's a, a regular thing. My question is, why doesn't Greg have, he's 13. Why doesn't he have a key of his own? Why isn't it attached to his backpack? I mean, I don't understand. Why does he have to have, why doesn't he have a key if he's coming home? I don't understand that. Um, now, mind you, I did work this case and you're going to say, well, if you work this case, why the hell don't you know all the details? <laughs> I worked this case in 1998. <laughs> I don't remember yesterday. You know, I'm sorry. I, it's a long time ago among hundred cases. You know what I mean? I don't remember all the details. I do remember what I thought. I do remember what I told the parents. I do remember analyzing the case. I don't remember certain little details. And quite frankly, I'm not going to spend 200 hours going through that today um, because this is a YouTube channel and I'm not working for the police department at the moment. So I'm not being paid. So I can't remember what the parents said at that particular point in time and whether it was valid. But it was interesting that apparently, supposedly, he did not have a key. and It was hung on the outside. Now, that there's a purpose for that claim. One is that if Greg had his own key, then nobody would see a key hanging outside. Nobody could have entered the house. You see, nobody could have entered the house prior to Greg arriving because they would have had no access. But so if Greg had his own key, he would have arrived home with nobody around. He would have opened the door, walked in, and there would be nobody waiting for him. However, if the key was left outside, in theory, a, another outside killer could come, take that key, open the door, go inside, put the key back out, and wait for Greg to come in. And that is, the, I think, the contention of the, the, the family, the parents. And I can't say family because there's only the parents left. Well, no, Zach is still there. Okay, so the parents, would that's what they would claim. So would Zach. Okay, so Greg comes home, opens the door. He goes in. Now, I'm going to show you very quickly the, well, not quickly. Why do I say that? Okay, I'm going to show you the layout of the house so you can understand how the crime went down. 
because this is important. I'm going to do the crime reenactment. If, and if you don't understand how the crime went down, then my reenactment is going to be kind of worthless to you. So anyway, in theory, up here, Zach, who was upstairs sleeping. Okay, but it doesn't matter whether he was or wasn't because we're talking about the killer, the killer, whoever the killer is. Okay, so anyway, down here, I got to work on this. So here is the door. So anyway, um, the door to the house. So Zach comes in, basically he, he comes in, supposedly opens the door and then comes in and closes the door. And I believe this is true. I believe he entered the house and closed the door. I do believe the killer was in wait, whoever the killer was. The killer was there because just as he came in the door, he was attacked. I mean, attacked right away. If you look up here, uh, his the key for, to the house was dropped. I, I'm not... I can't remember quite what all the numbers mean, but anyway, the key to the house was dropped about here and there was a debt. There was a table here that was crashed and knocked down. And that's where the a majority of, there's a lot of blood right there. So he was clearly stabbed a lot right there. And then he collapsed and then he managed to get his backpack off. I think because the backpack he felt was um, holding, waiting him down. Um, so he got the art or was pulled off. I don't know. You know, we don't know, but anyway, the backpack came off. And so there was a lot of stuff going on around here. He's being stabbed, 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 stabbed. Now, you come down here. See this spot here? This, this is the entrance to the dining room. But first, he tried to get out the door. I'm going to show you one crime scene photo, which is a crime scene photo, uh, which is, okay. So what you can see here, you can see blood. the door is partially ajar. And that's because Greg got hold of, you can see blood on the door too. He got hold of the door and was trying to pull it open. And the killer was preventing him from getting out. Now, right next door is the dining room. So if he couldn't get out this way, then he ran through the dining room. Okay, so now we have here the picture. Well, that's the wrong picture. Is that the right picture? No, that's the right picture. Okay, so, okay, okay, let's not, let me go to the next picture. Okay, so here he is. Okay, so over here, you see that now he's down here. He's trying to get out the door. He didn't get out the door. He's running into the dining room. Running, 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 running. Now, he's not being stabbed in the dining room. I can tell you that because there's not enough evidence of it. There are drop, blood droplets, which means he's, and they're not that fast. So I think a poor child is not like racing. I think he's trying to get, so he's trying to survive getting through the dining room. He's been, he's been stabbed a lot. I think he has probably, you know, uh, defense wounds. And he's getting through, he gets to here. Now, now somebody's going to say I'm wrong on this, but, you know, it's really hard because some of the information is, question is just poorly written okay there was a gate uh, like a like a dog gate so they didn't want the dog to get into certain areas um and he hopped over it now the 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 prosecution says he hopped he jumped over the gate now it's interesting when you watch this show on the whitmans now here's a picture of the gate okay and this is actually a crime scene photo that's the gate and there is actually blood. You can see blood around here. So these are actually, this is a crime scene photo. Um, the Whitmans later on in the, in the show, a uh, Mrs. Ms. Whitman, Mrs. Whitman, sorry, Mrs. Whitman. Is, if you look at this and you see everything looks different, um, it's probably because they moved to another house. But anyway, she's, can you see that? She's holding up her hands like this. Her claim is that the killer, after he stabbed, uh, Greg a number of times, then carried him over the 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 uh, dog, which is the dog gate. Um, it carried him over the dog gate and then took him to the the laundry room where he killed him. Now the reason I believe she's trying to say that is because a thirteen year old boy who is immobile at that point in time is, which is what she's trying to say. He didn't actually get over the gate on his own that he was a mobile you had to have an adult a strong adult carrying a 13 year old boy over that spot there's no evidence that he was carried over that spot at this point it is more likely that um greg had sustained a number of injuries but not fatal injuries enough that he could walk through the dining room and get over the gate he was trying to get out of the house Okay, so now let's look at where he was going after that. Uh, let me find the right picture. Okay, so now, okay, so he's gone through, it's just hard to, okay, he's gone through the dining room and he ends up, see, see this spot right here? This is where he tries to get out the, into the garage. 
because he's trying to get out. He tried to get out the front door. Now he's trying to get out the garage door. And there's, there's clearly he couldn't make it because somebody was preventing him from doing it, you know. And then he, he goes here and he tries to get out the back door. Okay. Now the back door, this is, this is from a television show. So it's, it's ooh, scary. I couldn't show you the real stuff because it's unacceptable to show you. Um, he tried to get out of the back door and it's clear that the door handle shows blood on it. Like he tried to grab it, but also shows a handprint above it, which is not Zach's. So the killer was trying to prevent him from getting out the back door. This is where he was killed. He was killed right here in the, see his body's here. He was stabbed to death here for the remainder in the laundry room next to the washer and dryer. That's where his body's found. Um, that's where the massive blood is. That's, you know, it, that's where the horrible scene is. Um, so that's where he ends up. And then the next part is supposedly the killer then leaves the house and goes out into the backyard and buries a couple of items in the backyard next to a pine tree. And this is this is from this is a police photo. They they used a rake because they were trying not to touch anything. They were carefully raking to see if anything was under there, and they found this. And this is a gruesome crime scene photo. Sorry, but this is at least not human. Um, this is the soccer glove. There were two soccer. There were soccer gloves found. This is what they look like, soaked in blood. This is a weapon. Uh, this is a knife uh, that was found with blood on it, and all the blood belongs to Zach. Now. So it, it does appear that whoever killed Greg then went to the backyard and buried the gloves and this um, this knife. Okay, so how interesting is that? Now, I just want to point out just for the sake of uh, my, my subscribers, love you all because you support this channel and I'm trying to keep it alive. Okay, let me tell you what some of my subscribers said. These are my, these are not, I'm sorry, not subscribers, my Patreon supporters, because they do support this channel monetarily. And I want to give you a shout out on that. Uh, so anyway, I just want to read you a couple. What people think at this point, they're like, well, this is kind of interesting. Karen says, hi, Pat, I watched a documentary. I think Zach loved his brother. I also think he killed him. Only someone living in the house would bury the murder weapon in the backyard. The parents cannot fathom that one son murdered another. Their position is understandable. It is not, it is not, but it is not evidence. And I love this point. Karen, you made a great point. Just because a parents love their son doesn't make it evidence that he didn't commit a crime. That's a that's an excellent point. I would like to know if you found the evidence of an intruder. And the answer here is, is just from the police reports and the DNA reports and anything else. The answer at this point is no. Okay. Doesn't mean an intruder couldn't be here, but no, no evidence was found, DNA or other evidence of an intruder that that we can prove. I also point, I want to point out something else here. I think Zach loved his brother. I'm going to say if he committed this crime, he did not love his brother because love is confused with um, when, when, when a person does this kind of crime, if he did this kind of crime, because I'm going to get to that. Did he commit this crime or not? If he did commit this kind of crime, no person who loves their brother or sister can commit this kind of crime. This is psychopathic. This means they're, and I've, I point out over and over again, my famous saying, you can attribute it to me, please do, because <laughs> it's, it's mine. A psychopath either believes you're useful or in the way. Useful can be you're fun to play with. You're fun to play games with. You're fun to have around. You, un, you're in the way means now you're, getting, you're stealing all my, my thunder. So I really want you out of my way. You're now the golden boy and I'm not. Now my parents pay more attention to you than me. And that can be the reason for homicide if you're psychopathic. But if you're psychopathic and commit this kind of crime, believe me, there's no love because psychopaths do not know how to love. So I, I will I disagree on that. Um, but I think your point is great that whatever the parents believe is not necessarily anything to do with evidence. So I love that comment. Lindsay comes along and she says, um, I watched the YouTube video suggested about Zach Whitman. I cannot believe he's now free and his parents are blinded by their love for him, I think. And, and, and the answer to that, Lindsay, would be yes. I mean, I think that some parents are, uh, you know, I'm not, again, I, uh, wait till I do the reenactment, which I'm going to do in just about five minutes. Um, every parent wants to love their child. I've seen, I've seen pe parents bring, have a serial killer child and go to prison and bring him, you know, everything he needs. 
because people say love is unconditional. I, I'm sorry, I'm not one of those people. I think love is very conditional. And when my children were young, <laughs> I told them it was conditional. I'm like, look, you know, when you behave, if you behave in such a way that I can't stand you, guess what? I'm okay with getting, you know, axing you as a child in my family. Uh, you know, at, at a certain point, uh, if I believe you're you're savable, <laughs> savable, is that a word? <laughs> I'm, I'm there for you. But if you're a serial killer, I'm, I'm done. You know, I mean, if you're a serial killer, I'm just sorry that whatever went wrong, went wrong. And I'm going to let God deal with it. And I will, I will, you know, yeah, I'm not visiting you in prison. So I'm very conditional. I always told my kids I'm conditional. And I'm like, I love you I, I, in the sense that I had you. You were my children. Uh, actually I actually have two children uh, that birthed and one child that adopted. They're all three wonderful kids. <laughs> and so, um, uh, but I always said, you know, nobody loves you unconditionally. It's your behavior that makes you a lovable person. And if your behavior is so abhorrent, it's so vicious and so terrible, you know, I'm going to go with society and say, you know, if you are a serial killer, I'm going to suggest a death penalty. And my kids went to their friends and said, my God, my mother said she. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, it's a reality. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, and I'll let the afterlife deal with you. You know what I mean? It's like whatever happens, you know, I'm letting, I'm letting that deal with you. Maybe you're, you're, you know, uh, you know, maybe you can be saved someplace else, but as you know, if you're going to go around like raping and killing women, I'm sorry, I'm done with you. Uh, but many parents are not. Many parents cannot let go. And they say, I love my child no matter what he does. And I don't, I think it's because, you know, it's, and my heart goes out to them because, you know, you raised that child, you saw them when they were little and they were cute and they were wonderful. And then you just can't believe they've gotten to where they've gotten to. So it is possible that parents, if their child is even a killer, can still love them. So, you know, and I understand that. Uh, Lisa didn't get a chance to watch the show. She, she's watched part of the show now, but she says, sometimes a quiet boy from a good home, you know, can he just says couldn't possibly commit his love, kill his loving siblings. She's watching The Motive, which is a great show about a boy who killed his entire family in Israel. But she's pointing out that, you know, just because you saw this kid in class or you saw this kid playing soccer or you saw this kid doing other nice things doesn't mean he's not capable of committing a horrific crime. And I think a lot of times the reason is psychopaths can commit horrific crimes and psychopaths do not act violent 24 hours a day. So yes, a psychopath will still watch a movie, say he likes you, uh, have fun, go to, you know, he, he does normal things. So you think because he does other normal things, he couldn't commit a horrific crime, but that's not necessarily true. And then Elizabeth says, when the mother asks Zach if he killed his brother, he replies, I would, I never would have hurt Greg. I'd say right there he's guilty. Um, yeah, but did you? <laughs> I learned that from Peter Hyatt. And Elizabeth is pointing out Peter Hyatt, who does great statement analysis. If you go to Peter Hyatt's uh, YouTube channel, you'll see some of his, uh, his really great uh, analysis of people's statements. Um, that Greg, Zach, if she asks Zach if he killed his brother, he replies, I never would have hurt Greg but he doesn't say kill. So that's an interesting point, but okay. So now those are just some of, some of my great Patreons coming in and my, my patrons coming in who support me on Patreon and uh, they're giving their opinions and are they right or are they wrong? Okay. So now I want to get to the, the reenactment, which I'm about to do. I got the knife. Okay. I'm going to take a little drink. This is going to be a lot of work. Okay. So I've got everything set up. <laughs> okay. I'm setting up my stopwatch. Okay. So I want to point out before I start this, um, that there's a timetable for when Zach had a time to commit the crime. This is the whole big issue. Now there's a girl, uh, and, and her name is Erin. She's a friend of Greg. She's like his little girlfriend, you know, she's 13, but you know, she calls every after he gets off the bus and she calls him, Hey Greg, how you doing? That kind of thing. Cause she knows when he's going to be home. She says she called at 309. She states that he usually comes home about 305 or 306. And that is supported by other people on the bus. The bus driver says they got back a little after three. He dropped off the kids a little after three. He doesn't know exactly, but a little after three. 301, 302, 303, 304, 305. And she says that normally he's home by 305. 
And this is very important. So keep this in mind because this has a lot to do with the time issues. Okay. So now at 310, okay, 309, she calls the Whitman residence and somebody picks up the phone and then hangs up click, click, just like that. And then at 310, Greg arrives home or does he? There's no proof that he didn't arrive home earlier. And this is my big point that since he could have gotten off the bus at 301, 302, 303, gotten home, he could have been there by 305, 304, 306. I don't know why there's an assistance that Greg arrives home at 310. There's no proof of that whatsoever. The claim is that she called, somebody picked up and hung up, and then he arrived home. Why? <laughs> Makes no sense. I mean, I don't understand what one has to do with the other. Somebody just didn't let Greg answer the phone if he was maybe not available to answer the phone. Anyway, okay, the 315, Erin calls again. She's an insistent little girl. Um, she calls again at 315. Zach does answer the phone at 315. And he says that Greg is not home. This is a very interesting point. How does he know Greg isn't home? Greg should be home by 315, shouldn't he? Because he's, you know, normally he's home at 305, at least, if not earlier. Why isn't he home 10 minutes later? Why does he say he's not home? Why does he not call downstairs and say, hey, Greg, Aaron's on the phone. He doesn't do that. He just says he's not home. Okay. Now at 317, two minutes later, Greg, Zach calls 911 to report that he thinks his brother is dead. Two minutes later after supposedly he says Greg is not even home. Now there's another point here. All right. Now here is, these are the stairs. Uh, supposedly Zach, now here's a very interesting point. Zach is supposedly, he claims, okay, Aaron Jeffries calls the Whitman re residence a second time. This is a 315 call and speaks to Zach, who is sleeping in his parents' bedroom at the top of the steps. How do we know Zach is sleeping in the parents' bedroom at the top of the steps? We know that because Zach said so. That's not, that's not evidence. Zach is claiming that. I, so many times in all of these reenactments, not reenactments, uh, in people's explanations, they'll say he is as opposed to he claims. Now, he could be truly have been asleep, but we don't know that because he's the only one that was there. So that's a claim, not an is. Claim, is, claim. So he actually is not, he's claiming he was sleeping in his parents' bedroom at the top of these stairs, which come down to where Zach was killed. Jeffrey, that's a little girl, Erin, believes this to be the upstairs phone due to the fact it makes a different sound than the downstairs phone. So she says when she called earlier, she thought it was a downstairs phone. When she called later, she thought it was the upstairs phone because it made a different sound. The girl is 13 years old. I'm not saying the 13-year-olds can't be right. I'm just saying you cannot base an entire case on a 13-year-old's claims. <laughs> Again, claims. I thought it was. Doesn't mean it is. All right. Okay. So now Zach says he does not think Greg is home. Thinks. And he does tell her that. I don't think Greg's home. Why, why don't you just call out, Greg, are you home? He doesn't do that. He just says, call back later. And he hangs up. Now here, he says he hears a commotion and believes it is his brother and a friend roughhousing. So Zach goes downstairs to investigate. First of all, if you think it's your brother roughhousing with a friend, who gives a crap? I'm sorry, but, you know, when what, when did a 15-year-old boy care that his 13-year-old brother was roughhousing with a friend? Who? How many boys give a crap what their little younger brother's doing downstairs? But he goes down to investigate because he hears supposedly a noise at the time of 3.15, which is two minutes before he calls, uh, calls uh, let's see, is that correct? 3.15, then he calls 911 at 3.17, two minutes later. So he's claiming at 3.15 he heard a noise, and he runs right down the stairs to check it out. And he sees, when he gets downstairs, that the table is and the hallway is, is falling over. This is the front hallway where Zach was attacked. I'm sorry, where Greg was attacked. So he says he hears a crash. He hears noise. And got, look at the house. Uh, now, you see where... You see where Greg ended up. Do you see where the stairs are? And you see where the noise would be? The noise is here. There's not going to be a lot of noise here. First of all, it's far away from the bedroom upstairs over here. And secondly, by that time when he's being stabbed to death on the floor, I'm, I'm not going to say he's not screaming and there's nothing crashing. 
this is a pretty silent moment over here. So if Zach heard from upstairs some noise after he hung up with claiming that Greg wasn't home, he would have run down here. And now <laughs> if he heard the crash here, that's what just happened. Then this guy would be chasing Greg over here and killing him. And where the hell is Zach at that time? Isn't he following whatever's happening and finding this guy killing his brother and then running to the backyard and burying the gloves and the knife? Kind of weird, huh? Okay. So now let's go back to the time frame. Okay. Aaron's first call to the Whitman residence is 309. And the claim here is that, that at 315, Zach speaks to Aaron. And then at 317, he calls not. So they're trying to say that in those two minutes, that somehow the prosecution is claiming that Zach was able to kill Greg in two minutes, bury the gloves, and then come back and call 911 and not be out of breath. Okay? That's kind of the claim. Here's the problem. We don't know that when, when she made her first call at 309, if, if Greg arrived home at 303, the 305, we're talking about five, possibly five, six, seven minutes of time for Zach to come down those stairs, be waiting for his brother coming in at 303 or 304 or 305 and chasing him around the house, killing him. And then by the time she calls at 309, five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes has already passed. He could pick up the phone and hang, hang it up and then bury the gloves and the knife, come back in the house. And then when the phone rings again, he answers. And we, of course, we don't have to believe that it was really upstairs. That's that's what she said. Doesn't mean it's true. And then you could say, hey, you know, uh, he's not home yet. And two minutes later, call 911. But is my theory plausible? Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Here we go. All right. Here's my here's my knife. Here's my phone. Okay. Now I'm going to hit. Oh, shit. I just don't. Don't hit that. See that? See, there's a... There's a start button right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my front door. You're going to hear it close. When you hear it close, that's Greg arriving home. I'm going to hit the start button. Then I'm going to chase, I'm going to stab Greg. Oh, let me put quotes around that. In the hallway where he was attacked. I'm going to stab him 40, 60. And I'll stab him 40 times. Because now there's a whole lot of issues about how many times he was stabbed. Now let me let me just see if I can bring it. No, here it is. Okay. Here it is. This is the evidence from the blood stain pattern analysis. And this is from the crime scene reports. This is the, this is what they say happened. Now there is a uh, 60, see this 65 separate stab wounds encircling the neck. So he's got like 65 stab wounds around here. And a lot of times you hear more than 60 when you talk about this case, but the six, the 60 some stab wounds is in here. And there's other stab wounds on his, on his back. And also on a couple on his face and then on his hands because they're defense wounds, okay? Because he's trying to stop whoever it is from stabbing him. So I'm gonna say those are the other 40 people sometimes say a hundred times. Okay, let's 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 go with 40. Just I'm gonna make this harder for myself to prove because I wanna make sure it's harder to prove than than the people are saying. So okay, so we're gonna start out. I'm gonna pretend I'm down here, okay, and Zach comes in the door and closes the door. And he drops his keys right here. So I'm assuming that's where the stacks, uh, the, the attack starts here, the table here that gets crashed. I'm going to do my best to replay this. I'm going to do 40 some stab wounds here. And now he, now he cannot remember. He tries to get out the door and then he goes into the dining room, jumps over the, the, the doggy door, the doggy gate, and then goes, tries to get out here. And then he goes into, tries to get out the back door of the laundry room. That's where he stabs 60 times. How long will you think this takes me to do? Okay, here we go. Bye. Just listen. I hope I don't screw this up because I've set up everything in my house. I even have things to jump over. And I'm mostly, be, oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. Hold on. I just actually hit the stupid thing. No, no, I don't want to start that. So good. My stopwatch. Okay. Um, I've actually set up things. Well, no, I didn't. Actually, I'm just putting out a bunch of books because I'm going to do a whole thing on what books I think are good for each area of criminal profiling. So I have this pile of books on the floor. That's going to be my dog gate. Um, so behind me is going to be my the, the laundry room. So over here, uh, over here, I'm going to have the door. He's coming in. I'm going to run around my kitchen a bunch of times, pretending I'm, pretend I'm going to the dining room. Then I'm going to jump over the dog gate and go into the, into the laundry room. 
let's see, how long does this take me? I'm going to do 100 steps. So I'm going to try to make it as much as I can to make it as accurate as I can and even make it harder than it would be. How long do you think it'll take? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, okay, I got zero, zero, zero. Here I go. Bye bye. Okay. Hope I don't screw this up. All right, here we go. All right. There's Greg. He's coming in the door now. Okay, here he comes. He's coming in the door. I'm going to start the thing. seconds. One minute and 11 seconds. Seriously. Woo. Okay. I'm 66 years old. I'm not 15. I'm not in a frenzy. One minute. And what was that again? Holy crap. That was quick. A little over one minute. And I did 100 of those. And I ran around and I jumped a gate. I did all of that. And yet he might have had two minutes three minutes, four minutes, five minutes before that girl called the first time and he picked up the phone and junk knocked it down. He might have been able to do all of that in that amount of time. Oh my God, I'm out of breath. Okay, so <laughs> I am so out of breath. Okay, so <sighs> oh my God. All right, so yeah. Um, let's go back to the, let's go back to the Oh, Joe says, no wonder she puts her back up playing table tennis. I'm good. Yeah, I don't play ping pong. I play table tennis. Okay. Anyway, all righty. Now I've got a problem with my screen. What? Okay, hold on a second. I'm having really weird issues with my screen, and I'm not sure what to do about it. My screen has gone really, really big, and I don't know how to fix that. That's freaky. I've never had this happen before. What in the heck do I do? Hold on a second, folks. I'm having a weird issue. I don't know how to fix it. Wow, that is super strange. Um, <laughs> okay, I, I, I want to go back to... What the heck? I've never, ever seen this happen. You can all see me still, right? You can all see me still? My, my, my... What the devil happened? Can you see? Me? I look okay. I look fine. For some reason, my 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 thing has gotten really big, and I can't actually change anything. And I want to change things, and I don't. I've never had this happen before. I don't know how to fix it. Oh wow! Wasn't that interesting? Well then, you can see me, but I can't. I'm having what I'm having trouble with is for some reason the screen has gone crazy, and I can't actually change anything at the bottom of the screen. I don't know, understand why. Wow. Um, Okay, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to fix it. And I have no, I've never seen it happen, and I have no clue how to do it. What the heck? How weird is that? What am I supposed to do? The the, the side of my screen is just um, dropped off, and and I don't know how to do anything about it. What in the world? So I went away, ran around the house, and it all went insane. <laughs> okay then. Um. Mm -mm -mm. Well, gee, that's nice. Um, I have absolutely no how to. I have no idea how to fix it. I'm going to try something now, and I'm going to hope that works. General, okay. 
green is green. Okay, I'm still screwed. I have no idea. Wow, that is unique. Okay, can you, uh, I'd, I'd say, can you still see me? But now I can't see anything. Oh, huh, interesting. Anyway, I have a green screen up here. Now, let me ask you this question. Can you see this behind me? Can you see me with a 911 call behind me? Can you see that? What in the devil? Oh, Lord God. Things have all gone wrong. I have no idea what the problem is. Can you see that? Upper right manufacturer. Yeah, I'm doing. Oh, you can't. Okay. I No, there's something really weird went wrong with this, and I do not know what it is. My screen has completely screwed up, and I can't fix it. See? Oh, good. You see the 911. Okay. Something is wrong with my screen, uh, and I can't fix it. So I'm just going to try to go with, I'm going to try to get around this problem. Okay. I want you to hear the 911 call now. Okay. I want you to see the, hear the. Am I still here? Because I just end up getting out of here and disappeared. Can you see me now? I'm still alive. Okay, it's still working. This is the weirdest thing I've never seen happen on. I've never seen this happen, and everything is completely screwed up. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you see me still? Lost Pat in my back. In my back. Oh, she's back. Okay, this is so freaky, and I, 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 I'm, I actually have no idea what's going on here. Um, everything is wrong, and I can't access... I can't access anything. What the hell? What in the world is this? I, I have no, I, I, all, all my, all my data is missing. I can no longer access anything. And it is absolutely completely freaky. And well, that's okay. I'm going to just have to go with this because I, for some reason, uh, stream, stream yard has completely gone berserk. Uh, no, I no. She's a pincher from the outside. No, I'm. I'm. There, nothing I do is bringing this back. There's some weird. Um, something has gone wrong with the entire uh, stream yard. Completely wrong, and I don't know what it is. I've never seen it happen before. Um, I, I can't fix anything here um, at all. So anyway, if you can see me, I'm. I'm happy. That's good because I can't see. I can't see a lot of things. Uh, I've op opened a new window. You're back. Maybe you should email with a new link. But you can see me, right? Good Lord, what in the world? It is so weird because I've never, ever seen this happen. Um, and it still says I'm live, so I'm still here. But none of none of my... Uh, none of my <laughs> I mean, everything's gone wrong, which is really annoying beyond belief. Um, Video and sound are okay. Well, you know, I I can't I can't understand what's going wrong here. Okay, you can see and hear me. So I'm just going to go ahead and just keep telling me you can see me and hear me because I can't move anything on the screen. It's all frozen. So anyway, but I want to talk to you about this. If you if you watch the 911, if you hear the 911 tape, which I was definitely going to show you, but I cannot access anything right now. Um, it will start halfway into the tape, which I think is fascinating. It'll start with. Um, Oh, I'm cutting in and out now. Oh my goodness. Am I really? Is anybody else saying I'm cutting in and out or is it just, just Doreen that's having a problem? Oh my God. I, I can't believe this. No, I'm cutting out. What in the world? <sighs> yeah. Okay. Back again. Okay. I can, I can hear you fine. Okay. I want you to hear what I'm saying here because this is a really important part. Um, you're fine here, but <laughs> I can't access anything. I'm completely screwed. And I've, I've done 40 videos. This never happened. So here we go. You know, it, it's these weird. No, I cut out twice because I was trying to get back to my original screen. And for whatever freaky reasons, I can't access my original screen at all. It's completely gone. I can't access anything. I can't access my pictures. I can't access my videos. I can't access anything. But I'm going to finish this right here. Okay. So, okay. So I know you're cutting out. Okay. Now, okay, wait a minute. Okay, I'm okay. Why don't you turn, what? Why don't you turn everything off and on again? No, because I can't, because I'll go out of the stream and then I can't come back in because this is live. So I can't do that, which sucks, but I can't do that. So anyway, but I'm going to talk about this. So I can't, sh I can't show you, I can't play you the video, which I had, but it is in the Whitman documentary. And it starts with 
uh, can, is he breathing? Is he breathing? And then Zach, Zach talks about, is he breathing? What they don't play is the beginning of the 911 tape, which I thought was freaky as all get out. I'm like, why wouldn't you play the beginning of the tape? And here's why I think they didn't, because they didn't like what the beginning of the tape said. And what was so weird was that I can remember from 1998 what the beginning of that tape said. And so <laughs> this morning I'm running around crazy because I'm like, why aren't they playing the whole tape? Because the beginning was interesting to me. And I found the tape and here it is. It's the 911 tape from the Zach Whitman case. You know what I can't find? <laughs> I can't find a tape recorder <laughs> to put it in because <laughs> I don't own one anymore. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, you got to be kidding. I want to play this for them, but I don't have the machine to play it with. Oh, my God. <laughs> hey, and, and, and you'll know what I'm talking about if you're old enough to use, know that you use a pencil to make, to twist the thing to, you know, make it work properly, <laughs> to move it ahead. <laughs> but I don't own a tape recorder anymore. So, but I did have the 911 tape. <laughs> but you can't hear it. But I remembered it. I remembered it from almost 20 years ago. I mean, even, so even more than 20, 20, more than 20 years ago. I remember it because it struck me so hard. And here is what, here is what they, he said. Now look at this. And I'm going to actually, because I, I actually remember how he said this. So I'm going to do a reenactment of the tape with his voice, but this is just, okay. This is just my version of it, but this is what I remember. 911 operator, your county 911. Oh my God. Oh my God. I just came downstairs and my brother, his throat is all cut up. I don't know. I guess he's dead. Hello? Hello? I just came downstairs. My brother came from came home from school. His throat, it's all cut up. You got to help me. What I remember is, oh my God. Oh my God. And it was like, what? It was the weirdest not like, like, like a fake thing. Oh my God. Oh my God. I just came downstairs. <sighs> Why did they cut this from the tape that they played on the documentary? And I think it's because it would make people say he's, he's not telling he's, he's, he's involved in the crime. Hit the way he's saying it is not natural. It's is a bad acting job. And when I heard this, that was my thought. It's a bad acting job. So what do you do when you got a bad acting job? Well, you know, you cut it out when you want to present a different issue. Now, okay, so right here, I just want to point out, and I and I got great other pictures I can't show you because my stream art has gone insane. So there was there there was a the defense team came to so let me tell you what happened when the parents are sitting in front of me. They had sent me along then. I had from the defense attorney, I had all the information. I had the, the, I said all the autopsy photos, all the crime scene photos, all the police reports. And I had looked through everything. And then I had the parents drive down from Philadelphia and they sat in front of me, the sad couple of parents, you know, and, and I'm, I'm the defense team is asking me to save their son essentially by profiling that this crime is committed by a stranger. And I'm sitting there looking at these parents and I remember what I said to them. And I don't, you know, I've worked a lot of cases. So if I remember it, it must have been pretty dramatic to me. I remember looking at these parents and thinking, I got to tell them this. And I said, if I were the prosecution, I could drive a Mack truck through the, through the defense case. That is what I said. I could drive a Mack truck through the defense case. And they were not happy, <laughs> shall we say. They were not happy. And I could drive a Mack truck through the defense case because here was the problem. And there are the defense people have put up, uh, they have a guy who, who says, well, he, he couldn't have committed the crime with such a teeny little knife. <laughs> no, the knife had his blood on it, Zach, uh, uh, Greg's blood on it. The gloves have Greg's blood on it. And all the, 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 when they analyze the actual, the forensics of the crime, the, this particular, and this is not the, this is not the knife. This I found in my, my, uh, my kitchen drawer. Um, this, the small tiny knife that he used indeed matched all the stab wounds on the child. And 
and one of the questions was, well, his throat was uh, cut open. He couldn't have done that with all the stab wounds with this little teeny knife or cut with this tiny knife. Let me tell you, these things are, can be pretty sharp. And also if you stab enough times in a row that the, the skin just pulls apart. So yes, one, this tiny little knife could have committed the crime. And, and this, the defense guy says, oh, well, it probably would have broken. Well, dude, it didn't because it was buried in the backyard with the gloves, the soccer gloves. And so, no, it didn't break. And there's no other evidence another uh, another weapon was used unless he like stabbed him all these times in the throat with this little little weapon and then decided that's not working. I'm going to get up and go get a kitchen knife and cut his throat and go back and wash the kitchen knife. Actually, that could have happened. They didn't prove that happened, but it could have. But I don't think that happened. I think he, that simply by stabbing him enough times in a row, the skin split apart and, uh, and caused what was a gaping wound. This was buried in the backyard with with gloves. Now, uh, I'm going to say, first of all, there, it is like extraordinarily unlikely. First of all, nobody had any issues with Greg. The kid was a 13 year old boy who played soccer. Who was going to kill him? What neighbor wanted to kill him off? What big person wanted to kill him off that would a know he was, his brother was, you know, think his brother was not home and come in the house and wait and wait for him and then stab him. Not a sexual homicide, not a robbery, just for some reason wanted to kill a 13 year old boy in such a violent and vicious manner. Very unlikely, very unlikely. So no, that didn't happen. Um, that this guy would do that. And then on top of that, he would then go out to the backyard and bury the gloves, which happened to be mm, probably, I would say Zach's gloves and Zach's knife in the backyard. So what he used weapons that were so close to what Zach already owned that they happened to look like they matched what he would own or that he used the weapon. They were just lying around the house for him to use. And then he felt the need to like try to, to bury them on the way out. He's not just going to run away. He's going to bury the weapons there, maybe leaving DNA. He's going to do that and try to, to try to implicate, to try to implicate. Um, oh, look at the, well, I, said, Alta, I got to see what Christine says. Wait a minute. Until full screen. Willie? Really? Okay, I'm going to try it. Alt delete. If I, if I disappear, though, I'm going to be so pissed. I don't have to. <laughs> if I, thank you, Christine. Let's see if it works. I'm just going to see if it works. What the hell? Alt delete. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Where'd my delete go? Why the devil did my delete go? I see alt. I don't see delete any place. Oh, there it is. Okay. Let's see. You're right. I'm going to be so in love with you. Guess what? It's not working. Nothing. Something freaky happened with uh, StreamYard. That's all I can say. I have no idea. Uh, what, what's what, I've never seen this happen, and I, I don't want to push myself out of stream art completely. So let's just go with what I got behind me. Um, so anyway, you you have a killer who supposedly waits and kills a 13-year-old boy for no reason at all, stabs him 100 times for no reason at all, and then goes and buries the implements in the backyard on his way out, even though Alt-Enter, not Delete. Okay, I'm going to try this, Alt-Enter. Okay, I'm going to try alt where the hell is it? Oh, oh, alt enter. Okay, I'm going to try this. If I get screwed, I'm so nope. Absolutely nothing is working. I think it's a StreamYard issue, and I can't fix it. So I tried that too. Alt enter. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, Joe. <laughs> Thank you for trying to help me. Not working. Um, alt enter is not working either. It is freaky. I've never seen this happen. Not a clue. I've tried everything. So anyway, so would would a stranger do this? And the answer is this is ridiculous. And secondly. When we go back to when supposedly Zach claims he was upstairs when the girl called the second time, he heard a crash down below. Well, he couldn't have heard, you know, if he heard that crash, he would have come down and found them right there and he would have caught the, the killer in the process of committing the crime. By the time, theoretically, he could have you know, gotten off the phone and come down, the killer should have already been in the in the laundry room and the, there's no crashing going on in there. So that's nonsense. So Zach is lying. He didn't hear anything. At that point, he wasn't upstairs sleeping. He didn't hear a killer down in the hallway at that moment in time and have the killer, you know, run and kill him in less than two minutes and then go bury stuff in the backyard. And he's completely oblivious to anything that's happening in there. No, that, that that's nonsensical. So one of the saddest crimes ever. And I think I've proven it takes it took me just a little over a minute to actually do a 100 stab wounds. 
and I, and I ran around my house doing it. And I'm 66, not 15. Uh, I'm not in a rage. And if he did all that before he answered the first phone call from the girl, he just hung up probably because he was, had just finished that crime. He actually committed that crime a lot earlier than people think he did because I believe Greg came home right after three o'clock. And there was ample time before that first phone call from the little girl that gave him time to do all this because all it took was a minute and he had like five to six, seven minutes to do the crime. And he hung up. I think at that point he went and buried the stuff in the backyard and came back in. And then she called. And now by that point, he's had a lot of time between the killing, the burying and coming back that his, they keep saying, oh my God, he didn't even sound winded. Well, because time had gone on. Do you hear me sound winded now? No, because enough time has passed. So he can come back in and answer the phone and say he's not here. Click. And then he has a couple more minutes, then calls 911. Um, so do I believe? No. And, 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 and Genovir says, uh, I'm trying to try to pull these up because they're off the screen. <laughs> and how come you didn't hear any screaming? If someone's getting stabbed, wouldn't they be screaming really loud? Yeah. I would say that the chances are uh, if, if he heard the crash, that's when he should have heard the scream. Because when somebody's just beginning to attack you, stabbing you in the back, because he had his backpack on, so why he couldn't get a really good you know, stab in the beginning. He had his backpack on, and he went down at that point. I'm sure he started screaming then. And then he would go down. And then later on, we run through the house and jump over the gate. And he's in the laundry room. He's probably weak at that point, And he's trying to get out. And then he's killed. So the screaming would be in the hallway where the crash was. But oddly enough, yes, you're correct. Zach never, says he it did not seem to hear any screaming at that point, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I, I, I entirely agree with you. Um, he should have heard screaming. So uh, and that's a, that's a good point. I want to point this out, Jolly. If I'm saying I'm seeing half of your thing, so I'm guessing what you what you're saying over here. <laughs> oh my God. It was planned, wearing gloves and then bearing the weapon and coldly waiting until ready to call 911. Absolutely. This was a premeditated crime. Now, when he confessed later on to try to get a, a shorter sentence and get out, he claimed that there was an argument between them over him not answering the phone or not letting him know the girlfriend called something stupid. This was not, this was not an, an instantaneous rage crime. No, it was not. This was a planned and premeditated crime. Somebody was waiting for him to arrive home with the gloves and the knife. This is not a rage crime. This is a psychopathic premeditated homicide. Uh, and sorry to the parents on this one, but you probably just accepted back into your home, the killer of your younger son. And it's really, really super, super, super sad. Heck. So, you know, Christine keeps saying alt and enter. It doesn't work. That's the problem. I'm not having, it doesn't, it's absolutely not working. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's something gone wrong with a um, stream yard. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I've never had it happen before, but there's just no way I can fix it. <laughs> um, now, some interesting questions that I can try to see. No, this is weird. They're, they, uh, and this is when any problem was any DNA found inside the gloves. You know, there doesn't seem to be a report on that. Now, I don't remember from way back when, whether there was like so much information that it was there, but I don't know that it existed. But regardless who was wearing the gloves, they should have found DNA from somebody. But what's interesting about this whole case is they didn't find any DNA from anybody else um, coming into the scene and, and committing these crimes. And so, you know, at, I look again at the totality of evidence. Pay attention to the totality of evidence. Who is the most likely person to commit the crime under these circumstances? Who is going to be able to do what he did and then bury stuff in the backyard? I mean, that's the fact, um, you know, and it, let's just see what else you said here. I literally thought about this case today. I mean, they found the murder weapon buried. Yeah. Um, and, and did Zach have any wounds? Yes. Zach had a little, uh, something on uh, a cut on his one finger. Um, yeah, really nobody's going to bury the weapons in the backyard. If you've just killed, brutally killed a kid, the, what you want to do is get the hell out of Dodge and you want to take that evidence home with you and uh, get rid of it someplace else. You know, you want to wash down the knife completely and you want to get, you know, hide that someplace else where the police are never going to find it. You want to get rid of the gloves where your DNA could not possibly be found on it. The only reason you're going to get rid of the gloves and the knife is because they're yours <laughs> and you can't go very far. Now, now, some people say, 
Well, he had all the time in the world. He could have gone elsewhere and gotten rid of them. Well, you know, you're right. But he's 15 and he's just brutally murdered his brother by stabbing him some hundred times. We're not talking about a rational teenage thinking. We're talking about a psychopathic teenager who has just done a horrific crime. So you can't really, you know, um, say rational when, when it comes down to this thing. Um, there's just literally nobody else who would do this crime. And there's nobody else who could have committed the crime in the amount of time with Zach being in the house. Zach is clearly lying about the that when he gets the phone call, he's clearly lying that, oh, I don't know if Greg's home. He doesn't call for Greg. He doesn't look for Greg. Um, nothing adds up with what Zach says. So we've got Zach not making sense. We've got the 911 call. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I just came downstairs. Now, why does he keep saying, I just came downstairs? One of the things we always point out with um, statement analysis is the first thing you say is the most important. For him, the most important thing really is, I just came downstairs. He wants to prove that he's not involved with the crime. If he says he's already downstairs, then he could be, you know, people could say, well, did you kill him? But he says, no, I just came downstairs. And I always point out the word justice followed by a lie. It, it amazing how many times this is true, but just often comes before, often comes before a lie. So came downstairs is questionable. I just came downstairs. No, you could say, oh my God, oh my God, I came downstairs. But he doesn't say that. He says, I just came downstairs. Lie coming up. And my my belief is that he did not just come downstairs. Um, but he was downstairs when this all occurred. And I don't, you know, I think they pay, the, the defense team tries to place a lot of, uh, um, uh, they, they, they say that this, the proof of this whole case comes into the fact that when the 13-year-old girl called Greg, that he answered, the, that Zach answered the phone upstairs the second time. And, you know, this is not evidence. This is an opinion from my 13 year old girl. I don't know exactly what she thought she heard or whether she remembered what she heard or whether she made up what she heard. I have no idea. I'm not saying she did anything on purpose, but, you know, sometimes you try to remember back and you remember what you remember or you misremember or somebody kind of encourages you you to remember something in a different way than you remembered it. So it makes no sense to me. Now, if, if she had said she called the second time and she believed he was upstairs, then Zach's commentary should match that. But what he says, he, when he says he didn't, he didn't know if Greg was even home is nonsense. And the fact that he supposedly hears then hangs up and hears a crash, but doesn't hear any screaming that makes no sense either. And then the fact that he would run downstairs to check out his brother tussling with a friend also makes no sense. And fourthly, is there, is there a fourthly? <laughs> that if he heard that something going on in the hallway, that he wouldn't have found the guy stabbing his brother just over in the laundry room 60 more times before he got out the back door to bury things in the backyard. None of Zach's story adds up. So I cannot, um, you know, Apparently, the defense team came to me. I, I, I rarely do defense work because most of the time the person is guilty. But, you know, actually, I did this, you know, I'm trying to think how long I've been a profiler. I did this pro bono because I cared about, you know, the family had lost their son. And they called me up desperate saying, please, please, it analyzes crime. The prosecution is trying to accuse our other son. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, poor parents. And let, let me tell you what I did sort of feel when I was sitting there with the parents. Yes, I felt the parents were in severe denial. And I also did from what they said. And I, I know I don't have this written down, but I just have this memory. And I say, for whatever reason, this memory stuck in my case, a few different things from so long ago, that Greg was the golden child, that there was something they kept saying that made me think that Greg was the one that was the cool kid, the kid who was cute, did everything, was was great on his soccer team and everything was good about Greg. But somehow I got a feeling that Zach wasn't he didn't live up to the expectations that they would like especially the fathers i think he did not live up i think supposedly from what i gather the father was a bit of a nerd and and actually from what i gather zach was a bit of a nerd and he wasn't that cool kid and that when greg came along it was like oh here's the cool kid finally and I believe Zach was extremely jealous of Greg. Uh, that's what I got from the story from the parents. And that's why I believe Greg, uh, Zach committed the crime. He wanted Greg out of his way. 
so that the parents will pay attention to him. And guess what? You know what happened? Once Greg was out of the way, the parents paid all their attention to Zach. They went constantly. Every week they went to see Zach, drove a long way to see Zach in the prison. They fought for Zach. They fought for Zach. They fought for Zach for 20 years. And now Zach has come home and they're welcoming, welcoming him with open arms. So I would say, wow, Zach got exactly what he wanted in committing this crime. Um, and I do believe he committed the crime. And since he has confessed to the crime, I can't get sued for saying I believe he committed the crime. Um, I do. And I think it's an extraordinarily sad, sad thing. And, um, you know, I, 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 I understand why the parents are in denial. Uh, because an awful lot of parents are in denial when one child kills the other. The old Cain and Abel story. Um, they do that. And it's, it, yeah, Lisa, Lisa points this out right here. I can see just half of your thing. Cain and Abel scenario. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, and um, it's it's truly, truly sad. I mean, I, I don't know. I've never been in a situation where, you know, one of my children killed another one of my children. I don't know where I'd be if I were in that situation. Just hanging on, maybe hanging on to the smallest thread of hope that it wasn't true. Maybe. Let me see what Lisa has to say, because I can't see what your whole until I click on it. I can't see it because it's off the screen because of whatever weird thing is happening here. The mother said that she wasn't able to have a child after Zach. And when Greg was born, they were over the moon. You know, yeah. But, I, you know, even then, I think, you you know, you could have had more of an equal balance in that. But, you know, I, I think there was some weird thing about Greg just being, you know, sometimes people have personalities. Kind of, that's why I pointed out my situation with my family. Um, I wasn't a bad kid, <laughs> but I was a weirdo. I mean, I always was. I mean, probably if you're at my channel, you recognize. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to have a little sip of something. Thank you, Christine, for your cup. I always call it Christine's cup. She sent this to me because it says, where does it say? Profiling. Hey, criminal profiler, Pat Brown. I love it. I always felt like the child that wasn't as well liked. Um, and I don't think I was incorrect. I think my parents loved skating and organ music. And I was a weirdo that wanted to do karate. I don't think they could relate to me. I don't, now that I'm older, I understand why that happened. And I don't blame them because, you know, sometimes we relate to different, our kids at different points in our lives. So all of a sudden we're like, our kid does something we're very involved with. And so suddenly we have some kind of good connection and then they do things that we're like, yeah, it's not really my thing. So we don't have a good connection. That happens in life. Um, later on, uh, my father, when I started writing, uh, my father, uh, he was thrilled because we had, we had a female author in our history and he was excited that finally this renegade weirdo girl finally was an author. And, uh, and then my mother started liking me when I was on television. <laughs> You know, suddenly it's like, oh, my, my daughter's on television. <laughs> but I learned a lot as an adult, you know, how to not to understand where they're coming from as an adult. Um, and so, you know, I had a great relationship with my parents all the way through to the end. Uh, but, you know, and they loved my children. I thought I was a great mom and all kinds of good things happened. But when I was a kid and a teenager, quite frankly, I was the weirdo of the family. And I so I understand the feeling. And I never had any anger toward my sisters at all. But I do remember being angry at my parents. Like, why don't you like me as much as you like my sisters? Mm. You know, <laughs> I had that feeling. So I understand where that comes from because, and it isn't necessarily that the parents are doing it on purpose. It's just that that one kid just clicks off, you know, they checks off all their buttons. You know what I mean? It's just everything. That's not, that's, I don't think it works. Checks off buttons. That's not the way it works. Checks off the list and pushes their buttons. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But that maybe Greg just was that kid. They liked his personality. He could do, he could play soccer well. He just did everything. So it made them excited. And then poor old Zach over here just wasn't getting their attention because they, they were loving him, but Greg was cooler, you know? So I, I just understand that's the way it is. Uh, as far as this goes, oh, that's a good point. Um, decapitation, decapitation is a personal crime. What do you say, Pat? The whole crime is very personal. I mean, I point this out a lot. Sometimes people will say, you know, a, a person was like stabbed a lot and therefore it's personal. Sometimes it's just a serial killer who gets off on stabbing a lot. But there's no there's no evidence of a serial crime. So this is extremely personal in the sense that somebody was really freaking angry at, at Greg. Um, and 
to the point where they wanted to eliminate them. And yeah, the decapitation thing meant, meant even though Greg was already down and bleeding out and there's clearly was not going to survive the person, whoever is doing it just really wanted to take it to him. Um, it, it's hard to understand, but when you're in that kind of rage that you have built up this rage. Now, some people say it's because I've heard rumors that supposedly Zach was involved in drugs and Greg was going to rat him out. Maybe true, maybe not. But there was a reason it came to that moment in time where he decided he wanted to eliminate his brother because his brother was causing him to be separated from his parents. Maybe he wanted to separate his heads because he was being separated from his parents, but that's a psychological weird thing, they say. <laughs> I don't go there. I just say that he probably just, at that point, was pretty enraged. And who knows if he was really trying to decapitate him or whether at that point when he was lying where he was, those the, the knife just cut in a row that just separated his head. I don't even know that was intentional. So, but does it, it takes a lot of energy. Yeah. Well, it took me a lot of energy running around my house. Um, I don't see drugs being involved. No, 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 no. I list, I know there were no drugs involved in the actual crime. I'm not saying that I'm saying there were kids who claimed that, that Zach was into drugs in some way, way or form. And it was being, and Greg was going to relay that to his parents and rat him out. But Again, these are one of the things when you're doing an investigation, you can hear a lot of crap from kids. You don't know if it's true or not. So I don't, I don't, when people say, what is the motive? I have no clue. I don't know if that was the motive because I don't know if that was true. The motive might be just, I'm tired of you, my parents being so excited about you and not about me. And if you were gone, I would be the focus. I'm good. So it's hard to, it's hard to know. Um, you have to know people to get drugs. Okay. Well, maybe so. But I didn't say neither here nor there. Um, Frat, Molly says fratricide by stabbing happens about 70% of the time in different articles I've read. Hmm. Um, well, you know, most of the time, I'll, I'll go with this. Most of the time, the reason fratricide happens with a knife is because they're usually teenagers who don't have access to a gun. <laughs> you know, you got to use what you got to use. This is in the kitchen. Gun probably is not. However, when you see mass murderers, you know who they, where they get their weapons from? A lot of times their parents leave their weapons unattended, which is why I always believe that if somebody takes your weapon and then shoots down the school, you ought to go to, you ought to go to prison for life because you let that, that psychopathic teen of yours access your weapons. Your weapons should be locked up. Um, but they, that's that they tend to find those, but yeah, most, most kids, the problem is the parents probably don't have weapons and this is in, Either now you see they're in your kitchen or in this case, this kid liked knives. Uh, Zach liked knives. He had a lot of different knives, so small knives, uh, not big knives, um, but he had a lot of small knives. Um, and, and and normally this is not something you say, oh, this is an indication of anything because kids have pocket knives and you know they're in the Boy Scouts and stuff like that. So the kid boys like knives. It's not a big deal, but they are available. So you gotta pay attention to that. Um, let me see what I, I'm trying to see. I, I can only see half of your statement. So what's cool. What's cool about this for you guys is I can, I can't really read what you're saying. So I can put it up and then find out, Oh my God, where normally I would say, I'm not going to put that, that comment up. <laughs> okay. Genevieve says, what about the witness in the documentary said that a kid in the neighborhood was complaining about a rich kid and wanted to kill them all. <laughs> that comes from the defense team. <laughs> really? Yeah. There's supposedly some quote older person. This is, that wanted to kill rich kids. The whole neighborhood was kind of rich, you know what I mean? Uh, when the parents came to me, it was it was often it was pointed out to me that it was possibly because they were Jewish, which is ridiculous. You know, I'm like, there's no evidence of anything because of because of your religion. I, I I don't see that. You know, come on. Is so this is the kind of thing that the defense team dredges up to try to make it look like, oh my God, somebody was out to get somebody. No, there's no evidence of a stranger being in that house. There's no evidence that anybody but Zach was involved in the killing. So, I mean, we can come in and saying a whole bunch of stuff. What? Okay, let me see what this is. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm 40 minutes into the documentary. Already the parents seem so sure that Zach couldn't hurt his brother. I mean, they have held on to this for 20 some years. I mean, and they were there, I say, in my house sitting there and they said he couldn't have done this. And I'm looking at the photos. I'd already analyzed the case. I'm looking at the sick one. What do I tell these people? You know, because, you know, I don't want to tell them. Because it's interesting. When a person commits suicide, the family tends to want to believe it's murder. 
rather than suicide because they don't want to believe their child would do that to themselves. In other words, I feel guilt. Like I didn't notice my child was that unhappy. So therefore they couldn't have committed suicide. I prefer murder. So I don't know how many families have come to me to claim that their child did not commit suicide, that they were murdered. And almost always occasional rare, rare cases that it almost always is suicide. Also, same thing with um, erotic asphyxiation where a child you or their son or daughter, mostly their sons, daughters, pretty rare, but sons like hang themselves to get you know, to cut off the blood to their brain when they want to have sexual. Uh, they, they usually have some porn available and they want to have this extra added zing to their sex, the orgasm. And they're usually found hanging naked with porn next to them. And then their families are like, yeah, let's hide the porn and say he was murdered, <laughs> even though he's naked. Um, uh, they then they'll sometimes they'll even go from erotic asphyxiation to suicide because they'd rather have suicide than erotic asphyxiation. So er erotic asphyxiation. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's go to suicide. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's go to murder. Yeah, that'll work because murder is somebody else's fault. It isn't your fault. It isn't your child's fault. Accidents, the same thing. I, I did a whole thing. If you want to look at it, it's on the smiley face killers where young men end up drowned. Um, there's never a sign of violence. Usually they've had a night of drinking or drugs and they end up in the, you know, somehow drowned and people, the family wants to believe their children were murdered. Not that their children did something really stupid and ended up drowning themselves because they, they don't want to, you know, you, you raise your child, you send them to college, they're doing really great. And then they end up drowned off a night of drinking to be that. How could that happen? It's so, so horrible. So stupid. So like in a second, your child was gone because of stupidity. Okay, he was murdered because you don't want to admit that. I was talking with my son one day and he was like, <laughs> boy, I did some stupid things. I'm lucky I'm alive. I'm like, yeah, probably, you know. But, you know, everybody does stupid things when they're teenagers and, and college students. And sometimes we're lucky we're not dead. But it doesn't make it murder. But parents don't want to admit it. So they go to murder. So murder is the thing they want to believe before they'll believe anything else. So, oh my God. Now I'll read that 911 transcript with new eyes. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry I don't have the, I'm sorry I don't have a tape recorder. I really don't. But, oh my God, I swear to God, this is what I remember. Oh my God. Oh my God. And I, I, it, it stuck in my head because it was so, um, without emotions. It was so monotone. Oh my God. Oh my God. And I remember this as like the worst beginning of a, I found my son, my, my, I'm sorry. I found my brother brutally murdered. Oh my God. Oh my God. And, you know, maybe someone can say I'm misinterpreting that or misrepresenting that. That's what I remember. So when I find, when I find a tape recorder, <laughs> I will find out what's on this. But I, you know, that I would remember that for 20 years. And I don't, a lot of cases, I mean, I have a lot of cases in my files back here and I, for God's sakes, do not remember. I'm like, I worked this case. Oh, oh okay. What did I think? And sometimes the people ask me to review a case. Oh, can you do this for YouTube? I'm like thinking I worked on that case. I do not remember what I thought about that because it has been 15, 20 years and you have so many cases that they don't stick in your head. Uh, this one, for some reason, stuck in my head. The parents sitting there believing their child was innocent. That stuck in my head. What I said to them, I'm sorry, I could drive a Mack truck through your defense theory. That stuck in my head. The, oh my God, oh my God, stuck in my head for 20 years. And there has to be a reason for it. So um, Lisa says, Zach says his father, the, I'm sorry, his, Zach says his brother is all cut up. It's an interesting choice of words. That is interesting. I don't know quite what it means, but it's interesting. Let's see what, uh, let's see what else we have here. Just be, oh, wait a minute. I can't see what you're writing, so I'm just clicking on half half screen. It's in those documentary for those who want to hear it. Yes, um, it's the I guess he's dead that gets me. Well, you know, I have to admit the the 911 guy was an kind of an idiot because you know Zach was clearly saying that he was dead, and his throat was completely gashed open. And he couldn't have possibly be breathing. And the, the 911 operator is saying, let me help you give him not give him, you know, CPR. What? <laughs> the kid's throat is open. You don't give CPR to a person's throat is open. I mean, I don't know. That 911 operator needed to be fired. So that was a weird thing that just was pitiful, um, truly pitiful. He should have just simply said they're on their way. 
um, at that point. Can you, is he breathing? No. Why do you think he's not breathing? Because his throat is completely cut open and, and there's like a, a ton of blood and there's no way he's breathing. His eyes are fixed. Yeah, whatever. But to, t to tell him to give him CPR was just the weirdest thing I've ever heard from a 911 operator. So in that condition, and I think he should have just been fired. So that was that was craziness, absolute craziness. Um, let me see. Okay, let's, I can't see anymore. Okay, that's my last comment that I can possibly see. Let's see if I do this. What happens? Oh, no, that's still not working. God, this is so annoying. I have absolutely, this is the weirdest screen I've ever seen. And it's never been this way before. So it's like, I'm afraid to touch anything because I'll just get knocked off completely. But anyway, I just, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I, I wanted to show you a few more things, but I can't. Uh, but I think the, thank God I was able to get through the um, crime re reconstruction. Because I think you can see from the crime reconstruction. That crime can be committed in one minute. And people don't believe this. They think that things take a really long time. Oh, 100 stab wounds, that must have taken, you know, 10 minutes. Like, this is not the way people kill. How you feeling? How you feeling? How you feeling? That's not the way people are killed. They're killed this way. And if you even, let me just do this just out of curiosity. I'm going to. I'm going to redo my stopwatch. Resetting. I'm just going to do 50 stab wounds. Start. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 50. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Actually, I could kill, I could do 130 seconds, half a minute, I could stab 100 times, four times a second. That's how fast people can stab. Especially when they're, no, mind you, it's a small, tiny weapon. And a lot of the stab wounds weren't really deep. They were just the little things. So I can kill, I can do 100 stab wounds in 30 seconds. And, and I added in running in through the house, extra time in between, bigger stab wounds. And I, I came up with just over a minute. So you can't tell me you can't do this in two or three minutes and have lots of time to take a breath, relax, and make a phone call to the police 911 and say, my brother, oh my God, oh my God, my brother. Um, and this is what people don't understand about crimes. They believe things that they don't know are true. And it's unfortunate. Um, so ja Janine says, I wasn't aware of this case. Thanks for doing the show. The sound reenactment was quite entertaining and informative. I'm going to have to look back and see what it sounded like. Cause I'm like running through my house. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not quite sure what that came out to be, but that, my whole point is that unless you've gone through all that and actually can, and uh, can understand that. And that is one of the most misunderstood things, how quickly you can kill somebody. It's really quick. And understand, too, when a person is in a frenzy and they want to kill you, they're not taking their sweet time about it. A serial killer might. He might say, you liking that? Ha ha. How you feeling now? You like that? How you feeling now? Because he wants he's a sadist and he wants you to feel the pain. He wants you to feel what I got it close. If he cuts your throat, he wants to see you suffer. He wants to watch this. If you're in a frenzy. Because you just want to do all, do somebody in, you're not waiting for their response. You're just trying to kill them, kill them, kill them, and so it can go down very quickly. And people need to understand that. Oh, thank you, Anna. Remember to thumbs up. It helps the channel. Yes, it does. <laughs> what? Oh, this is interesting. Molly says he moved like a robot in the video during the trial and did not seem as friendly toward his father as he did his mother when he was released from prison. Interesting. I, you know, um, one of the things I love about having subscribers and pa pa patrons um, is a lot of people see things that I don't. Uh, and it's not because I'm an idiot, like my haters would like to say, but just that I don't have the time to put in the extra time because I'm working on all the different cases and trying to explain many things and doing lots of research, but I don't have time to see everything. So I'm so thankful when you, you can add to the conversation. Very interesting. Yes, I, I felt that. Uh, I felt the coldness from the father and I felt an overcompensation from the mother. I did feel that. 
Um, I did. Uh, and, you know, it was a short interview I had with him. So, you know, it's just the way I felt. Um, uh, and, you know, sometimes when you do a short interview, you can't really be sure what people are totally what they are because they're presenting themselves to you and it, you don't have a lot of time. But, I, you know, I, I, I do. I did feel that. And I felt like there was something about you know, in one of these cases, I have to say this, a lot of times when we talk about serial killers, what we see is a cold father and an overcompensating mother. That's very common for serial killers. Um, and I think, it, especially, you know, especially male serial killers, they don't get what they want from their father and their mother uh, are suckers, you know, <laughs> so are their sisters a lot of times. So a lot of times they live with their mothers or their sisters because they go, oh, well, you know, I know he's got problems, but you know, he's a really, you know, I think he's my brother. He's my son. He's a really decent. No, I don't believe he's a bad guy. The father's like, I don't like my kid. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm um, behind the scenes, but, you know, I certainly think that uh, you probably got a good point there. Oh, thank you very much, Molly. Great show. Thank you. In spite of all the technical issues again. Watch out. Never seen before. Just freaks me out. Um, the Lisa says, oh, this is interesting. Lisa says the mother says she and the father cope differently. Yeah, as do all people. Yeah, they do. I mean, they cope differently also before the fact than after the fact. And I think this is important. Um, a lot of times people say, well, you know, th th this family, they they have, let's say they lost a child to homicide. I'm not going to say which family this was, but because there's no point in it. But I know a family and they lost a daughter to a brutal homicide. Parents were devastated. But I didn't like them. <laughs> you know, I didn't. I didn't like them. And the point being that what you are before and what you are after is probably the same thing. So they, for me, if I'd met them before the homicide, I wouldn't have liked them. If I met them after the homicide, I wouldn't have liked them. So the same thing is true in any of these cases. So a person could be very sweet before the homicide. They're probably sweet after the homicide. They're cold before the homicide. They're cold after. They don't cope well. They do they don't cope well. In other words, you don't become a different person because of what happened to your child. You take whatever you have into what happens to you. Um, so you don't become a different person. You are that person. You know, you don't, you don't live 20, 30, 40 years as one person and then become a different person because your child is killed. You, you still are the same person. So a lot of times people don't understand that that's the way it is. I mean, and so, yeah, if they cope differently afterwards, they probably cope differently before as well. So let's see. Uh, Lori said, "Hi, Pat. I almost missed you." Well, hey, it's a, it's, 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 uh, it's recorded, so you can come back and see me. <laughs> Keep going, you'll grow. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I may not grow as much, as as strongly as some, but I hope that I can present to the people who are interested with the kind of material they want. That that's more important to me. Uh, so let's see what this is. Um, Lisa says, I wonder if they blame themselves deep down inside. Um, I would say everybody knows who they are and how, they, well, and how they behave to some extent. But a lot of people are in denial, again, a denial before it happens and denial after it happens. So we don't see ourselves necessarily the way other people might see us or the way our kids might see us. You know, there's nothing more humbling than when you, you know, your kids grow up and they say, and then you did, and you're like, did that um and sometimes the kids don't remember correctly either so you know and i say that as a mother who says you did not remember that correctly. <laughs> but some things my kids say about me that i don't like are probably true because i'm not a perfect person i wasn't a perfect mother i thought i was a good mother but i don't know that i was a perfect mother and so there's probably things that they say, my mother did this. And I'm like, shit, damn it. Yeah, okay, maybe I did do that. <laughs> but I'm not going to admit it in front of your friends. <laughs> you know, because I, as you see me now as a profiler, guess what? I was a mother for, I'm still a mother. <laughs> I, got, I got three kids. But I raised my kids. I homeschooled my kids. I was home with my kids a lot. What you see here is what my kids saw. I don't know if they liked it or not. Or they liked some of me, but were like annoyed with the other part of me. Same way you would be today. It's like, I really like Pat Brown, except for what she does. 
that's human beings. And so we're not perfect. So uh, the Whitmans were not perfect parents. They were parents. Uh, I'm not saying they were responsible for what happened to why one of their children would want to kill the other child. But they may have had some issues of their own that came across to the children in a certain way. It's also possible that, you know, psychopathy has developed very young. They may not have recognized they had that a psychopath had developed in, in Gregory, I'm sorry, in, in, in Zachary, Zachary Whitman. They may not have seen that. A lot of parents deny what's in front of them because they can't, they're like, oh, he's going through, he's going through a growth thing. It's just a boy thing. You know, yeah, he likes to stab kids in the eye with a pencil. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he'll get over that. <laughs> he lies a lot, but you know, he's a kid. A lot of times the psychopathic behaviors are there very, very young. And there's a number of children, uh, uh, kids who went to school with Zach who say he was, a, he was weird. They will say he was weird. What does weird mean? I don't know. People thought I was weird too, but I hope I'm not a psychopath. But I was, if you ask people, they would probably think I was a little weird. Um, but they definitely thought Zach was a little weird. And I don't know what their entire reasoning was, but maybe he exhibited psychopathic behaviors at the time and the parents never realized it. And therefore, when you get to be a teenager, you get to be dangerous if you're a psychopath. Um, hopefully, you'll go into a nonviolent psychopathy, but you might go into violent psychopathy and become a serial killer, a mass murderer, a family murderer, whatever you become, um, criminal in general. Uh, you know, but the parents don't understand why their kid became that because they did provide. Let's let's be realistic. The witness provided at least a nice home. I mean, we see the videos of them playing with their children, seeming to enjoy their children. They were in a middle class, upper middle class neighborhood. It's not a bad, it's not a bad home, but maybe whatever personality issues were there, whatever happened was just a bad mix and it ended up in a bad way. And so I'm not necessarily blaming the Whitmans for, you know, what happened. Um, it's just, it's, not, it's unfortunate. Sometimes just really bad things happen. That's all you can say. So... <laughs> Oh, aren't you nice? You're so smart. You're saying so many things I haven't thought of. Well, <laughs> that you know, I don't know how smart I am, but I do hope that I say things that other people don't. Uh, I I kind of don't have a filter. That may be a psychological issue. I don't have a great filter, uh, and I've always believed mainly because because I believe in the truth. I like the truth. I like facts. I like being open uh, because I think that's how we learn. And if and if I sit here and Oh my God, I don't want to piss anybody off. So I'm going to say, I really don't know. Could he be guilty or couldn't he be guilty? I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much because I'm a, I'm going to do a 50 minute show because if I say any more, I mm, might get in trouble. Okay. But I've always been this way. <laughs> I've always believed in telling facts and I find facts interesting and I find discussion interesting. And so, yeah, I probably don't have a filter and that's why I like doing live because I can talk to you guys and you can talk back and, I'm like, eh, you know, that's what's cool. And, and as I point out many times, I'm 66 and I don't give a shit. So, you know, <laughs> I know I'm never going to work on it. I don't have to worry about working. I do. I would like to keep the channel going. So there is an issue with that. But, you know, I can survive. You know, I can survive. Um, fast, Doreen says, fascinating show, Pat. Thank you. I'm surprised I've never heard of the story since it's semi-local. You know what, Doreen? For some reason, it didn't didn't get the media's attention very much. It really didn't. I, I, I don't know why, because it's such a freaky, freaky crime. But for some reason, it just didn't really impress the media. Um, so yeah, you, you hardly see very much about this. And if you go to YouTube, that's where you always can find out how, how well publicized a case was. Because if you put in something like, hmm, Summer Wells, whew, you know, you've got, you got every YouTuber in creation going, I'm doing a show on Summer Wells but you hardly see anything on, on, on the Zach Whitman case. Um, just a little bit, just a tiny little bit. You see one, one documentary and you see like three people who I didn't even, two people, two people who I didn't even know, who, no, two people and a defense, defense guy telling a little bit about the case. Very little information out there. Uh, just sort of came and went, uh, you know, who knows? Um, Molly says, I thought it was very unusual for the mother to insist on Zach having some of Greg's stuff in Zach's room when he came back from prison. That's really creepy. Yeah. Um, wow. I think they changed houses at least. Thank God for that. Um, you know what I mean? That would be weird to come back to the house theoretically. 
Oh, well, that your brother died in. Supposedly they changed houses. That's what I read. Not sure I'm accurate on that, but it seemed that way. But they would move some of Greg's things into his room. I don't know if that's, again, their way of den den denial that well, we know you didn't kill Greg. That's why we will that we know you want to connect with things that are Greg. Not maybe denial. That's what I'm going to guess. <laughs> Lori says live is more fun than watching after. Yeah, you know, I like to do live more than any anything else. I mean, myself, I like to do live because you just don't know what's going to happen. When I do uh, recorded stuff, I feel much more constrained uh, because I have to get it done and it has to be, you know. And you're not here. Nobody's here. I'm just talking to the camera. So I really, really like having people here. Carrie says very persuasive. I learned so much. Zach is a psychopath. Okay, as a criminal profiler and not a psychiatrist who has had Zach, uh, Zach in my office, I cannot say he's a psychopath. What I can say is that it is very unusual for a non-psychopath to commit a violent crime like this. Um, people like to believe there's a thing called, like, um, you know, crime of passion. He lost his mind in three seconds flat. Nobody, I mean, you know... I've been annoyed at my sisters, but I never thought of picking up a knife and stabbing them a hundred times. And I certainly didn't think of it as a premeditated thing. Like when my my sister comes home, you know, I'm going to be waiting behind the door. I'm going to get her. What the heck? I, the thought of even stabbing somebody is beyond me. I just, I can't fathom that. Um, I don't even think I pitched my sisters. I was a very, very nonviolent human being, but I didn't even pinch. So I'm like, I can't imagine staying there thinking I'm going to stab my sibling to death. That requires psychopathy. So if Zach committed the crime, I'm going to say Zach would then be likely a psychopath. That's as far as I can go. <laughs> Lori says I'm 63. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Jess says that's why it's important to do crime scene reconstructions. Absolutely. Because you learn so much from that. Um, and and I really believe it's very important in many, many crimes to do that because you can really see how things go down. And a lot of times people just talk about it. They don't actually know that it's true or not. They just talk about it. Let's see what else we have. Dr. Phil said, what? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got... Yes, yeah, so I know. Dr. Phil had Summer Wells parents on Thursday and Friday. And you know, I have no love for Dr. Phil. So it can still be an interesting show just because you're looking at what Summer Wells parents have said just not fond of Dr. Phil. What can I say? Okay. I'm going to try to see what I can. Oh, okay. Let's see. Yes. They change houses. Thank you, Molly. I, I believe they did. I thought that was uh, when I was looking at the show, the part where I had thought I had read that they changed houses. And when I was looking at Ms. Mrs. Whitman, supposedly carrying <laughs> sack over that dog gate, I'm like, that doesn't look like the same, the same setup there. The, 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 the um, wallpaper, looked different and, and the and the dining table was different so i'm like that can't be the same house so yes I, I i believe they had moved houses but i just sometimes when i do this show i kind of lose my mind as far as what i remember is true or not true <laughs> that's, that's why i need you guys here you know because you can help me you know remember things that i don't remember at all um and so you know sometimes somebody will come in later and go you were wrong about that and i'm like yeah probably <laughs> you know it's a lot of information to take in in a very short period of time and to relay. And sometimes you just kind of miss a thing or two, shall we say. So anyway, um, so I'm sorry about all the technical difficulties. I'm glad whoever's here stayed through those. And I'm assuming I will never see this again. And I'll probably never know what happened. And I, I don't even know how to stop. <sighs> yeah, this is weird. I don't even know how to end the show. <laughs> Because oh, this is this is wait a minute. <laughs> the whole the whole normal framework is gone. So you usually hit end the show. <laughs> There's no end the show. I have no idea what screen I'm on. It's the freakiest thing ever. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. There are allegations Dr. Phil allowed something behind the scenes that led to Candace Wells getting very emotional on camera. Oh my god. Well, since I don't trust Dr. Phil as far as I can throw him, and I've seen his behavior behind the screen behind the behind the scenes and because he edited me out of his show and then stole my stuff <clears throat> which i can prove um i don't trust what he does behind the scenes because i think that's unfair there's a lot of things you know like people say for example oh you know talk shows never pay people to be on well they don't pay experts they just give you a, you know they just want you to come out for 
you know, they give you a, a plane ride and a hotel and a lot of times they don't even pay you per diem for eating. It's like, yeah, you, you're going to pay me. Um, but a lot of times they don't want to do that for the experts. But And they say they don't do that for the guests, but you can never be sure that's the truth because they might say, oh, we don't pay guests to come out. But we're going to give them a $1,000 a day per diem. And they're going to be here for three days. So we're going to give them $3,000. <laughs> so in other words, their per diem is extremely high where a, uh, experts per diem is non-existent. So they will pay people if they want them on. Um, and they will also manipulate people and they will do whatever they do before they get on the show. And then they will do whatever they do after they're on the show with editing. So never believe exactly what you see. So uh, Dorian says, of course, you mean to the whole show is disgusting. I, I'm not going to agree with that, but I'm also not going to disagree. Okay. <laughs> Molly says, Pat, you have to keep going. Uh -huh. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Lori says, you have me look at Dr. Phil differently. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's, it's frustrating because on one hand, there's a lot of shows out there that get a lot of interesting, you know, discussions that get interesting interviews. And I do benefit from some of those, but I have a really hard time sometimes supporting the ethics or the non, the non ethics behind the show. That That's so tough for me. Um, because I, I'm a big ethics person and I'm no perfect person, but there's some things I'm just like, that's just wrong. You should not be doing that. And television will do whatever they want to do to support their agenda, support getting, getting uh, sales or whatever they're trying to do, they will do. And so you can't, that's why you have to be very careful when you like, even like what I was pointing out with a 911 call here, they edited it. And all I looked and looked on like YouTube, like somebody has got to have the full, thing here. Oh my God. Oh my God. Where is it? And it wasn't in existence. So why did, why was that edited out? Because to me, that was the most interesting point of this entire 911 call, but it was edited out. Why? So it's not that they didn't present something that was accurate in the sense that they presented part of this 911 call saying it was a very long 911 call. So we could only put up part of it, but they picked the part. So that were, requires a determination, a decision to what part you want to present. And they'll just say, that's what we did. And so they're not technically being unethical. But on the other hand, they may be being unethical. You know? So it's hard to say. Um, was, <laughs> thanks for the show. And I hope no cats were heard during the reenactment. Anybody who knows, I got the evil cat Ziggy. And no, Ziggy, Ziggy, the Ziggy is... <laughs> Still alive. I better watch his butt. I love cats. I do. I love my Ziggy. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> Lisa says, oh, thanks for a great show, Pat. This is why I'm a proud Patreon. Pat never disappoints. Thank you, Lisa. That's so kind. I mean, you know, it's one of the things that keeps me going because, I, you know, I, I, I want to educate. I want to present things to people so they can really understand the reality of things because so many shows, so many shows are just telling a cool story. So many shows just they're representing, I don't know, they're making money off a of true crime. Um, and I would really like to be able for people to understand how things work. And I've, I've been amazed over my, all my years of television. I kept trying to do that. And, you know, I got some of it done, but a lot of times I was constricted by how long I was allowed to talk or by the editing process. So I couldn't get across what I'd like to get across. So, hey, thank you, YouTube, until you knock me off completely off the air. Uh, let's see what Joe says. Uh, is Oprah the reason why Dr. Phil's on television? And if so, is it too late to sue her? You know, I don't know what it is about Oprah, but I think she also got Dr. Oz on, which is an, another questionable character in my opinion. Uh, I, I don't know whether she personally picks the people or it's a whole thing done with the networks. Uh, she also has had a number of authors on with, with books that are a complete pack of lies, like, uh, What's that? A million little pieces. That was a complete lie. I mean, she's, I don't know that she's got, uh, I don't know. I don't know whether she's naive or she knows what she's doing or she's got, you know, I don't know. I, I, I can't say what I know why she's picking the people she does to support, but I haven't been overly fond of the people she's picked to support. So there you go. <laughs> Lori says money, money, money. You know, there's a truth to that. Um, Let's see. What, what is that? 
boxing, lots of blah. Wait a minute, I missed that. I don't know what that was about because I can't see half of this. There is always news to report on Summer Wells because Don won't stop getting wasted and seeking attention from all the channels that want new material. You know, and there's a there is a there is a point to that. Um, people ask why do certain cases get more attention? Well, sometimes it's because the families open their mouths a lot. If they were quiet and said, look, I want the police to handle this and I'm done with you media people, then there wouldn't be much. But if, if, if the family or whoever keeps going into the media and opening their big fat mouth, yeah, the media is going to jump right on it. Now, sometimes people do that because they want their they want the case to be solved and they think that the more media attention will help. That's not necessarily true, but that people believe that. And the media will want them to believe that because they want the they want the stories. And some go into the media because they want to they want to uh, get people to believe they're innocent, and so they they want to say constantly, you know, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Look look the other way. Um, some people think if they don't appear in the media, they will look guilty. So there's a whole bunch of reasons people do it, and the media loves every one of those reasons. So. <laughs> um, Aw, you're honest. Thanks for doing this. I thought you try to be honest. <laughs> Maybe you'll be live 24-7. Oh, my God, I hope not. I want to have a life, Christine. I really do. I want to have a life. <laughs> Let's see. I used to love Oprah, not anymore. You know, it's funny because one of the things I've been pointing out lately is that an awful lot of a lot awful lot of people who used to do other things are going to crime crime news, which really annoys the hell out of me. A uh, Dr. Oz who used to hawk completely questionable products <laughs> for health. He's supposed to be Dr. Oz is about health. He suddenly went to crime. Dr. Phil used to be about family relationships, and then he went to crime. Um, so there's a whole bunch of people who are out there. Uh, and that's true for, uh, um, 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 oh shoot. Now, okay. What's his name? <laughs> now, oh my God, I've just lost my mind. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay. It's the Alzheimer's. It's the Alzheimer's doctor. What's his name? Um, son of a bitch. Um, I hate it when I have no memory. Okay. You know, um, there he is. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dr. Todd Grande. <laughs> I lost my brain. Okay, Dr. Dr. Todd Grande, which sometimes I think has interesting things, but sometimes I think he goes too far into crime and he doesn't know what he's actually, he's not able to do crime analysis because he's a he's a mental health worker. Um, not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but a mental health, uh, he does mental health, um, you know, to, uh, he worked with uh, people with addictions and things like that. And his channel used to be, I mean, years and years, which is why he's been an, YouTube forever, years and years of psychological uh, discussions on how to, how to, you know, do stuff with group therapy and single therapy, really good stuff. But he always focused on just therapy issues. I mean, tons and tons. If you look back and it's think like almost 10 years of therapy stuff and all of a sudden he went through a crime. I'm like, what the hell? Because you're not a crime analyst. You're not a detective. You're not a profiler. Why are you doing true crime? You know what? Dude's making a fortune off of it. That's why he's doing true crime. He's fig he's figured out a, a you know how how to make money, um, and he's figured out a, a methodology which is I'm going to read something for an hour or an hour and a half. I'm going to do a 15 minute bit on it, and I'm done for the day. And he does one every day on true crime. It's brilliant, you know. He's he's figured it out. Uh, but there's a lot, a lot of people who are going to true crime who are not people who should be in true crime. I mean. Um, you know, Kenneth Maines, I'm okay with, he's, he's, he's like, you know, he's, 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 an, he's a retired detective and he's, he's really good at a lot of stuff. Um, and then Peter Hyatt, he's, he's a, he's a police, you know, he's worked in police, uh, interrogation and, 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 uh, statement analysis for years. And all of a sudden we got all these people, Dr. Oz, Dr. Phil doing, and Dr. Todd Grande doing crime stuff. What the heck? Why are you doing that? Because the other stuff doesn't sell as well, but crime sells big time. So you got a lot of very um, questionable stuff out there where people aren't able to do the proper analysis because they don't have any training in it or any experience in it. They're more a case of, you know, they're doing, uh, uh, you know, whatever they're doing. <laughs> um, oh, he's not a criminal profile. Well, he's certainly not. I mean, you know, he does, he does, you know, he's got some good thoughts. I'm not, not entirely opposed to some of his thoughts. I Sometimes I totally disagree with him. 
on a number of cases. But sometimes he's got some good thoughts in the psychological arena, you know. And I don't object to people having various viewpoints. That's okay. People can have various viewpoints. Um, and it's nice when people come from various viewpoints because then we see things from a different angle. Oh, I never thought of that because I'm not in therapy, uh, you know, psychological therapy stuff. Or I didn't see that because I'm not a journalist. Or I didn't see that because I'm not a criminal profiler. It's all cool. The problem is that everybody seems to be going to true crime because they can make money off of it. And so I see some shows are just dismal. I'm like, and then people are like all over it going, oh my God, this is so interesting. I'm like, mm, not really. Let's see what Joe has to say here. Uh, Pat, what was the name of that journalist you mentioned who was asking awkward questions about the McCanns? I think you said he's Australian. Oh, yes. Um, he's not, he didn't ask awkward questions. He has very insightful questions. Um, his name is, I mean, let me, Mark. <laughs> I have to work on this because his name is weird. Mark Sonokonoko. Sonokonoko. So, it, okay. He has, a, he has a podcast called Maddie. He did interview me for one of the segments, and it was a very excellent interview. He, he's interviewed the German prosecutor who has a new Christian uh, Bruckner suspect, um, and he did brilliant with that. He's an actual 100% investigative journalist, and I love him his work. And uh, I don't love too many journalists work. I love his. His na name is Mark. So no, no. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> just to be, just to be fair to Mark, because I can never pronounce his name. It's so embarrassing. Uh, but, but he does have an unusual name. Like say Mark, I'm going to put it in here. Just a second. See, I'll be sure I'm pronouncing it. So no, go, no, go. Yeah, that's it. Mark. So no, go, no, go. Mark. So no, go, no, go. Yes, he um, is, is brilliant stuff. He's with uh, Nine News Australia, um, and he did the Madi podcast. And he is the one of these those I can actually say this is this is a guy you should listen to. Uh, done done excellent excellent work. Um, what's this? Really, that's fascinating. Anna says Dr. Granny has been very open about what he's doing. He was severely injured and disabled in an accident, and the videos are financial source. Well, he's making money. Um, and I, again, I don't object to him making money. Please believe me. Um, you know, there are people, people work very hard on YouTube. I, I understand this now that I am I'm doing YouTube. God, Lord, it's one of the hardest jobs I've ever had. People don't know how much work it is. Um, and he's that he does, he's making money is fine. My only concern is that he's delved a little bit too much into criminal and cr crime scene analysis, which he's not really skilled at. So sometimes I just think he's off the mark. That's all I'm saying. Um, Oh, well, that's true too. True crime is partly tongue and cheek and entertainment. Yeah, he does have a he does have a sense of humor. He likes to make little jokes. Uh, and again, I'm not objecting to people watching his show and enjoying his show. Uh, and I've actually recommended his show sometimes. I did not recommend a couple of his shows, well, at least one of his shows, just because I thought he was completely off the mark um, and was going far past his abilities with uh, psychology to analyze the crime scene and it just made no sense to me. So I wanted to point that out. Um, no, no you, yeah, it is improperly spelled. Mark is M-A-R-K. So Noko Noko is S-A-N-U-O. That's correct. And then it's K-O-N-O-K-O. -O -O. So Noko Noko. <laughs> it's a toughie. It is a toughie. Um, wait a minute. Somebody said something. Thanks a lot. I'm trying to, I must, yeah. Okay. Wasn't there a, Oh, yes. So what's the video I did about a book? The vid was like a week ago. Yes, I did a book on my search for Madeline. It was by John Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E, -K -K -E, Clark with an E. He is a British journalist living in Portugal. He does the Olive Press. He did a book um, called The Search for Madeline, 14 years. And then it was like 400 and some grueling pages of absolute torture where he tried to prove that the new suspect in the Madeline McCann case, um, Christian Bruckner was definitely, definitely the guy. But then after 400 and some pages, I think it's 437 pages. He didn't prove it at all. And it was like, just, just die. So anyway, I, I did do a video on that. You can check it out. Um, it was like a week ago. And I was just like, uh, I read this. I, I bought this book. I did the, I read this book. So you don't have to, <laughs> you know, because I just thought it was, egregiously bad and proved absolutely nothing. And he had, he's definitely one of those people that is absolutely a, a supporter of, of all things pro McCann and refuses to look at evidence ever. So 
I, I want to speak up because he should not be getting a lot of money off of that. <laughs> so anyway, um, I was really, I don't know what that was because I can't see the rest of your comment. I just love not being, oh, really, oh that's a spell, spelling. <laughs> hey, you know, it's a difficult spelling. You know, it's why, you know, I had a, I have a long uh, maiden name, German maiden name with four N's in it. And whenever I got awards and stuff, which was pretty rarely when I was a kid, but it was always, they'd always leave, like misspell it and leave some of the ends off. And so when I got married, my name became Brown, B-R-O-W-N. And I became professional as Pat Brown. And when I got divorced, I'm like, you're not getting your name back. Because <laughs> people can say my name on TV. It fits on the book. And I can order pizza, you know, <laughs> not getting the name back. <laughs> so I'm a happy Brown for ever after. And I, it suits me fine. And, uh, you know, although I did love my maiden name, which I'm not going to give right here. But anyway, mine was not quite as long as Mark's, but it was pretty darn long. So um, let's see. Well, a couple last things. So Zach, Zach confessed to burning his brother, yet the parents still protest his innocence. Yes, Jess. The claim is that the only reason he confessed to anything was because he wanted the shortest sentence, which is half legitimate. I mean, I don't know if I were in prison, I was looking at a lifetime in prison, or I could confess and get out like now. I might do it because I, I can, you know, screw it. Everybody thinks I killed him anyway. I'll just say I killed him and then I can have, a, I can get out of prison and have, maybe I can go someplace and live 30 years from, you know, I'm only 30 some years old. I can have a life. And guess what? He probably will have a life. Um, so I can't say that his confession necessarily proves his guilt. Then you could also say, on the other hand, would you confess to brutally murdering your brother if you didn't do it? Now, if it were me, I would never confess to that if I didn't do it. I just That's just me. I'll spend the rest of my life in prison. But maybe I'm an idiot. Maybe I should say, you know, I don't give a crap what anybody else thinks. I'm going to get the hell out of here. So there you go. Um didn't you say that the McCann book is doing very badly, not selling? It's, it's not doing well, Joe. Um, but, you know, he self-published it. So he doesn't have a big support thing behind him for advertising. It is getting some sales. It's just not doing great. Uh, I think he's going over a lot of ground that nobody really cares about, quite frankly, because most of it's about him and him and him and about him and his work and how he how he interviewed here and he went here and he went here and he went there. And so if somebody really wants to prove that the McCann's are innocent and that, that this Christian Bruckner is guilty, they might read the book. So I'm sure he's got a number of people who will read the book, but it, it's self-pubbed and uh, probably hasn't got a great deal of press, although he did get a few, a, a few stories. So it hasn't been selling well, but then, you know, I've had books that tank too. So <laughs> I can't say it's because he didn't write a good book and it tanked. But I'm just saying, he didn't write a good book. So there you go. Um, and I don't, you, I don't do reviews, anti-reviews on books very often. I mean, I don't like to do, I don't like to trash people's work. But when I see something that is complete nonsense, I, I kind of have an issue with it. So there you go. Um, let's see. This was great. I won't be talking about this show, but not that book. But I can't see half of the mismeshes. Uh, Lori says, I wouldn't survive in prison. So I'm very, <laughs> well, you know, okay, I did it. Whoever you said I killed. I dang well killed him. I uh, killed him off. Yes, I did. Whatever you say, if I gets me out of here. <laughs> oh, you're late again. Uh, what? <laughs> okay, I'm just going to laugh at this. I'm late again and started at the beginning, so not sure what part you're on right now. But I just got to the part about Dr. Phil and the Wells. Not sure if he paid them, but he bought, bought new teeth for Candace. <laughs> I have no idea if that's true, but... Again, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind these shows that people don't realize goes on. And if they want what they want, you know, they can say they don't pay guests, but then they can change the name of the guest and call them a, uh, oh, let's say they could call them a collaborator. <laughs> okay. We don't pay guests, but we pay collaborators. Like I think the, um, uh, uh, um, Anthony's. I think they got money. So I don't know what they called them when they gave them a contract of some sort. So you can call it, you can change a name and then say, we don't pay guests, but the collaborator would pay 10,000, 20,000, $50,000 to. If they think they're going to make a crap load of money off of a, off of a show, they'll find ways to do it. And the reason they don't pay experts very much or not at all is because they always know they can get another expert. And quite frankly, experts aren't 
as important as people think they are. It's like, yeah, somebody might like to see me, but if I ask for, oh my God, you know how many times this has happened. They call me up and say, okay, we want you to do this documentary. Uh, we're going to fly you to whatever location. It's going to take three days out of my life. You're going to do four hours in the studio, which is usually torture. It's not, it's not much fun to do these things. Believe me, I'm telling you, just sitting there being able, having to repeat things over and over again so they can get a proper edit on it is, is really tedious. And then nobody wants to eat dinner with you. So you end up going out to dinner by yourself and then you go back to your, your sad little hotel room by yourself. It's not exactly fun. So, and then you say, how much are you paying me? And they go, oh, well, we don't pay. You know, we, you know, we'll give you the, I'm like, I don't want to work for three days and, and, and suffer the, 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 you know, flying these days and staying in a boring hotel. I mean, why would I want to do that for no money? Oh, because um, it'll get you publicity. And then when I say, no, I won't do it for no money, they, they dump me in a heartbeat and find somebody else because there's always somebody else. So rarely, unless I'm so specifically involved in a case or so no more than anybody else, they can dump me in a heartbeat and find somebody else to do it for free. So that's, that's the reality of TV. It's lovely. So anyway, what does he say here? Did he use that as a sweetener to get her on the show? Maybe, you know, did you ever say the McCann's are guilty? Never, never, Lori. I never said the McCann's are guilty. I said, uh, the evidence, the evidence supports there is no proof of abduction and that much of the evidence points to the McCann's not being honest and points to the McCann's possible involvement in what happened to Maddie. That's how I, that's how I presented it. <laughs> uh, not always interesting truth. It's about the views. Yes, it is. I mean, it's, you know, it's very unfortunate and I wish we'd stop, you know, I, you know, I understand. I mean, it's like me. I mean, people say, well, why do you even have money to support the channel? Well, you know, because it's a frick load of work and I'm not doing other work that's that I earn money from. And yeah, I'm, you know, it's not like I never want to work again in my life. Uh, because I'm 66, but my mother lived to 93. So, you know, I got a lot of years. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to keep working. And if I'm not doing this work and I'm doing this work, it would be nice to have enough money to support the channel so I'm not like totally taking a to complete dive. So I get why, you know, a television show wants to, wants to be successful. It's going to pay its people. It wants to go back on air again. I understand that. So everybody's got a multiple, mo multiple motive thing. But then there comes the point where we have to be honorable too. And if honorable costs us 50% of the income, so it does. You know, um, I don't think it should cost us 100% of the income. I prefer not. But if it costs us 50%, I'm good with that because I prefer earning a living but being honorable at the same time. That's just my thought. But what is this? A wealth reported that a wealthy woman paid 5000 for Candace's teeth. Hmm. Hello, wealthy woman. Can you help me out here? I'm kind of, you know, they're not as good as they used to be. Um, not sure, Jess. She refused to let them in the upstairs of the house and let them in only the downstairs and had the dungeon cleaned up to look like a halfway normal kid. For the Oh, you're talking about the Summer Wells case. Holy crap almighty. Um, you know, here it's, that's a really interesting point on the Summer Wells case. You know, we're far into this show and a lot of people have left and that's okay. Um, but if you haven't left yet, do remember to, because I'm not going to show the end of this show because I don't even know how to end this show because my screen is gone. So don't forget to like subscribe and share and look down below and all the links for buying books and all those things. Okay. Anyway, the summer Wells case. I watched the video, which was very interesting where, where, um, uh, the house was shown. And then there was this going into the basement was like underneath, like this, like this counter, you had to like go underneath. It was like going into a dungeon and down there supposedly was where, where the parents slept and then Summer slept. And it was extremely creepy. The house was an absolute pigsty. And, and, and look, I'm very lenient about a variety of people's ways of living. I know that people live in different ways. I know they're, they're poorer people. I know they're people who just don't have the money to do certain things. I know they're people who are obsessed with thrift store shopping or buy so much crap. They, their house is full of crap, which was the Wells house of unnecessary crap that then makes it, you know, uh, almost unlivable to be there. But the, the actual going, you had to actually duck under this, 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 this shelf thing to get in, to go down the stairs into the basement, which was about the creepiest place I've ever seen anybody have their kids sleep. I mean, 
it was appalling. I, if they had just left the kitchen alone and taken the living room and just cleaned the whole living room out and put a bunch of bunks in there for the kids, I'd be good with that. And the parents can go down to the little dungeon. It was a creepy house. And I'm not surprised that um, child welfare wouldn't be all over that house for abuse. I mean, there's, there, it was beyond acceptable. Okay. Beyond acceptable, even for people with alternative lifestyles and poorer people and all that kind of crap. Um, these weren't people actually who were that poor. Uh, these were people who chose to live the way they lived. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised that drugs were involved in this. Um, I don't mean drugs involved in what happened this summer. I mean, just drugs as a part, part of possible one or both per parents' ways of living. Um, but it was pretty appalling. So the fact that parent, uh, you know, the mother would even uh, take, you know, Summer's mom would even take them. Like, it was, an, it was on a YouTube show, so I'll give him cr the guy credit for that. I forget his name. But anyway, he, he got them to take them down to the basement. And I'm like, you know, and it was kind of scary, kind of scary stuff. And that doesn't, again, mean that they did something to Summer or somebody did something to Summer that was connected to the house. But it did show that, the, that what was happening in the house was concerning and that that's one of the reasons the police are looking at uh, not the I know somebody in the family is being su suspect in what happened to Summer Wells. So anyway, that's just my comment on that. Pat, I love your analysis and your live shows. Just wanted to say your theme music is perfect. It really gets me going for the show. Well, you can think, you know, it's funny, Russell, you say that. My son my son found that and put that together for me because I have no ability. And uh, somebody else told them that that was the one thing they hated about the show because it like, like was too loud and obnoxious and it gave me a headache. <laughs> She can't, no matter what you do, you can't quite win. And and the person who said that, I like them very much. So, uh, you know, uh, I probably will not change it because I don't really have the energy to do so. So <laughs> Lori says, Summer's mom knows something. Very, very concerning. Yes. Um, the theme tune gets, the theme tune gets me pumped too. Oh, okay, cool. I'm just going to leave it there because I mean, it's, it's, it's there and I, I like it myself. I think my son did a good job. Um, <laughs> but what, what, oh, this, uh, Laurie says, oh, yes, the children were taken out. That's correct. They were um, because there were great concerns about the welfare of the children in that house. There should have been great concerns about the welfare of the children way before. But, you know, um, and I don't know how much was, you know, here's here's another problem which I just want to bring up. And sometimes people say, why don't they social services pull the children out way earlier when 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 they go to the house and go, Jesus, God almighty, what in the. Mm. You know why? Because they got a lot of houses like that. There's you, it, you go to so many places and it's so bad that you're like, I can't, we can't take all these children out of their houses. Where are they going to go? We're going to, we can't find foster homes for all these kids and pulling them away from their home, maybe make their life worse. So unless we know that the kids are like really being brutalized or murdered, we're kind of probably just going to have to let them stay there and we're going to work with the family. That's why they do that because it, it the alternative is so difficult. Um, people don't people say, well, I don't know why they. Yeah, that's why because because sometimes it, you don't have an alternative. Um, same thing is true with the police when when uh, people come in and say, you know, my my mommy did this to me. My mommy hit me. My son, my 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 father hit me. A lot of times it's just whiny whiny te teenagers. And even if it isn't a whiny teenager, maybe the parent did hit them. Maybe it's because the kid was a brat head and. The police is sitting there going, look, we get if you're in child uh, protect uh, child abuse and uh, child abuse detective, you may get this constantly and you can't put everybody in prison. You can't arrest everybody and then have to try to prove the kid is telling the truth. So unless it's really egregious, you kind of go, well, you know, just stop pissing your parent off. <laughs> People think that social services and the police can can move in legally and do all these incredible things. And. They just can't. They don't have the money. They don't have the time. They don't have they don't have the backup services. They don't have the foster places. They don't have the proof. They don't have a million things. So unless something is horrific, a lot of times they just go, no, the kids are watching television. So we're just going to let it go. They're eating they're eating popcorn. They're still alive. <laughs> and that's the way it works. Life is not perfect for everybody. Um, children are born into situations which, you know, we wish they weren't born into. Um they're sad situations. They're not perfect. But, you know, a lot of kids have grown up in imperfect situations and turned out to be great people. So, you know, life is life. Uh, so unless the, unless life crosses the line where it is something clearly illegal, 
you often can't do as much about it as you think people could do about it. I mean, when you come right down to it, you know, that's what family's for. That's what community's for, to try to stop these things and not have to bring in, you know, the big guns. Um, but, you know, schools try, families try, uh, community does try, but sometimes you just can't, you can't win them all. You know what I mean? You can't always do something. I mean, I've been in a situation where I've tried to inter intervene and it hasn't gone well, you know, and that, that's not as professional as just as a human being and hasn't necessarily gone well, you know? So there you go. And, uh, Jess says the Cleo Smith case was a rarity and there's still more to come out. Yeah, they're talking right now about a woman being involved that Cleo Smith, a little girl who went missing in Australia out of her tent um, and then is found with this creepy dude who likes dolls. Um, now they say there's a woman who came every day to the house and, and, and clothed and helped her dress and cleaned her up and did her hair and all that stuff. So then I'm like, what the heck is this woman's thing? So it's hard to know if it's a couple who was involved in something. Now there's that they were like into like playing house or whatever. Um, some people will say there's more connected to the family, but I won't go there because I don't have any evidence that this is true at this point. And so let's let the police take care of that. And it either is going to be what it is, or the police will come out eventually and say, oh, well, there's more to this, but we don't know. And I, th I think it's unnecessary to go there on based on rumors. And there's a lot of rumors going around the internet and I have no clue if any of those things are true, um, at all. So that's what I don't want to go there um, because we don't know. Let's see. I can't see how. Uh, I don't know what that is. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, some of these things, I, I, I don't know. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say, you know, in this particular Cleo Smith case, how the guy glommed on to Cleo and how he knew they were going camping and how he ended up at the campsite. Cause clearly it seemed to be premeditated. So if he was just at the campsite and grabbed her, but he, you know, again, he might've been, maybe the dude just hangs out at campsites <laughs> and he saw Cleo and he went for her. So we don't know that yet. Or did he follow them? And how would he know to follow them? And would he know they're going someplace? There's a lot of questions. So it's like, how did he get that child? And, what, what, what's going on here? It's a very freaky case um, and very, very much an anomaly. And it may always be an anomaly, you know, maybe just one of those things. Sometimes weird stuff happens because people are weird. You know? And then we try to make it into something normal when it's nothing normal about it. You know, it's like the dude was weird and he had a dude, a friend who was weird too. And they decided to do this weird thing. Maybe. And maybe the family has not a clue about anything or maybe there's more to it, but we're going to have to just be, um, you know, patient and, and accept whatever is there. He says parents are involved. Can't prove it yet. <laughs> and then it says, what are the chances of the woman who cleaned and groomed Cleo Smith is an alter ego of the man who is accused? Maybe he's a one man family. <laughs> wow. <laughs> hey, that's an interesting one. I have not heard that one before, but I, it was like Norman Bates, you know, pretended he was his mother. Could that be true? Maybe. But you know, I kind of think it's this. I think the guy he likes dolls and he got a living doll, but you know, the problem with living dolls is that they're not, they're alive. You know, they cry, they whine, they poop, they smell bad. Their hair gets messed up. You know, those, those little dolls you get in a package and he kept most of them in a package. They don't get disturbed. They're like perfect and they don't complain and they don't have any needs. But then you get the little lot live doll and dang it, that, that, that thing, that thing, they got to take care of that thing. So maybe he did enlist somebody to take care of her. Or maybe, again, there were a couple together that he had this fantasy and she had a fantasy of having a child. I have no idea. I don't know how any of this went down. Makes uh, It's a very peculiar thing. And one thing that's important about being a profile or a detective is that when something's really peculiar, you keep investigating, but you don't necessarily think there's always more to it than you think. Because sometimes it's just freaky stuff. There, some people are just freaky. That's all there is to it. They're freaky. And I've been in this business long enough to go, that's a new one on me. Never seen that before. And yeah, there, yep, yeah, there it is. There it is. So, but don't post your lives on social media. Huh? I, I post my lives all over social media. I have no idea why I shouldn't do that, Jess. Uh, hey, I've been out here for you know, over 20 years. I've had stalkers, I've had haters. You know, this life, you know, but if you're not 
in the public eye. Maybe that's your talk. I don't know if that's what he's talking about, but if you're not in the public eye, you want to be a little more cautious. But then again, if you, if you have Facebook, you should only have your friends on Facebook. Let me tell you this for safety purposes. Now I have a few Facebook pages and altogether I've got like more than like 11,000 followers. I don't know who the hell these people are, except for you guys. I know who you guys are because you're wonderful, but I got a lot of people out there. I don't know who they are. And that's because I'm in the public eye. But if I have a page is just for friends and family, I'm not going to tell you that I do or don't. That one, I only allow friends and family on. And anybody control, everybody controls their Facebook page. You should never allow anybody on your Facebook page that isn't friends or family, unless you're just one of those people who wants to have a thousand, two thousand, three thousand followers to prove that you're really cool. And everybody wants to come to your page. You know, that's your business. But if you want to be protective, you just have people you know. Your teenagers should never have anybody on their page they do not know. And, and that's just, they shouldn't be clicking saying, okay, I'll accept, I'll accept, I'll accept. No. Twitter is different. You kind of open like to everything. So um, don't go on Twitter unless you're willing to, every time you post, everybody in the world can see it. Uh, you can always block people who are like weirdos, which I do all the time. That's why everybody on Twitter now loves me because all my haters aren't there anymore. But you know, you just have to control your world. That's always important, just to control your world. Um, and that's supposedly, we heard this, uh, that the suspect followed the mother on Facebook and she posted her activities online. Perhaps. But, you know, tons of people do that, and usually their kids aren't kidnapped. So this was, again, a, I think a very, very freaky, freaky case. Um, he's a friend and follower on one of her social media pages. Yeah, I heard that, too. And it may well be that she didn't pay any attention to who was following or friending her, and she was, like, cool about everybody friending her. I don't know. Um, Lori says, freaky doesn't always mean criminal, right? No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't. That's the thing. You, There's a lot of people who are freaky. And this is another point um, that a lot of times we'll say, well, the guy's freaky, so he must have committed the crime. No, not necessarily. There's a lot of freaky people out there who haven't done anything wrong. I mean, this is why I objected with the Madeleine McCann case, because, you know, just, I'm just looking now. What? Why is everything look blurry? Just Oh, there, it looks normal again. Okay. Um, the Madeline McCann case, the Christian Bruckner guy, was a creepy guy who lived in the area who was a criminal. And so they said, oh, my God, he, he, he did this crime. Well, there were a lot of creepy people around Madeline McCann in that vicinity. And I'm going to guess if you go look at your sex predator, you know, addresses near your house, you're going to find a bunch of them. Um, you're going to meet creepy people down at the 7-Eleven, creepy people at the at the, at the gas station. I meet creepy people all the time, just out there in society. But a good portion of them aren't criminals. They're even creepy. They're not even just freaky. They're creepy. Uh, so freaky. Yeah. There's a lot of people with weird, weird hobbies. Um, what makes a person freaky? You know, I mean, what, what does that? You have a dog. You're not freaky. You have an iguana like me. I don't have an iguana right now. I have, I have a, I have a, I have a dragon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a lizard um, and people think that's freaky because what does a woman my age like reptiles? Well, I've always liked reptiles and I think they're cute. I'm, I'm not, not a really a dog person. I'm more of a reptile person. And so, yeah, you know, I have, I have a reptile, a bunch of them actually. And people always thought I was a little freaky because I was a big iguana lover all my life. I love to green iguanas. And does that mean I'm, I'm, I'm a strange enough person to kidnap children? No. Or, or somebody has a lot of dolls. That doesn't make them a, a, a kidnapper of children. So you can be freaky and you can be creepy, but doesn't make you necessarily criminal. So I think that's a good question because when you're a detective and you're looking or, or profile and looking at people, you have to say, okay, if they're super freaky or criminal in a certain way, I may want to check into them just because that may have moved over into criminality. But on the other hand, it doesn't make them a criminal. So let me not just rush off to saying they're criminal when I have no proof that they are. So one has to be careful about that. Um, Open-minded, careful. So let's say somebody, let's say somebody stole some iguanas 10 miles from my house and dressed them up in little clothing and put them on the internet. And they're looking for who's an iguana thief. <laughs> because <laughs> I have openly admitted to liking iguanas, I may become a suspect. <laughs> and then I'd have to prove that I have an alibi and I didn't steal somebody's iguanas. And I don't dress iguanas in little clothes. I think that's kind of like ridiculous, but often cute and put them on the internet. So, you know, you have to be open-minded, but also 
do your investigative duty. So anyway, uh, Charles says, good show as always. Small town. How many degrees of separation? I don't know. That was a small town, but he was about three miles away. And uh, as far as Cleo goes. And so gosh knows. And oh, and if, if you're talking about, oh, if you're talking about uh, the Madeleine McCann case. Yeah. There's a lot of people who live in Prairie de Luge and Prairie de, Prairie de Luge. And it doesn't mean that they kidnapped Madeline just because they live there. So, yeah. Um, so oh, oh, let's see. Let's see a couple more and then I'm going to call it a night and try to figure out how to stop the show. And I have no way how to get back to the original screen. <laughs> Speaking of weird, I read people are selling worn panties online. Do you think this might function as a step closer to an actual assault in those who will go on to offend? Well, Kelly, I think it's the women who are selling the, the panties. They're, they're basically like porn actresses in the sense that they are selling sex to people who are obsessed with certain things. Um, so yes, I do sell those and they are sold to men who obviously have issues, very big issues that they would buy this kind of uh, item online. And, I'd be more worried about the men. The woman is just taking advantage of dudes who have issues, but the dudes who have issues who want to buy this, then you wonder whether they, they cross into peeping Tomism or stealing because, because one thing that often goes from peeping Tom to the next level is that peeping Tom will then go into the house of the women and steal their underwear. That's, that's not unusual. So is this a, is this part of a peeping Tom thing? You know, that they will be interested in buying such, such items but apparently they, they make a lot of money off of it. So isn't it sad <laughs> to think that this is, there's a lot of people in the world who would pay for that. That's really creepy, but not on, not on, not unheard of. Yes. Not unlikely. Very concerning. So let me see one more, one more comment. I hope your show does well and you can keep doing it. You're my favorite YouTuber. Oh, and these days I keep telling peeps about your Patreon hangouts. Thank you very much. We, we want to keep you around for good. I appreciate that. I, you know, I'm, I'm seven months into this and, um, and I've seen, I've seen uh, a good response to the channel uh, in spite of the fact uh, that I don't, I don't advertise in very many places. And, um, and I try to tell the truth, which does piss off some people. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I, uh, whoever is still here, <laughs> the cool thing is to me, people become subscribers to my channel I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged that they, they want to learn and that they want to hear more truthful things. And they're not just here just for, you know, creepy crime story stuff that they actually want to learn something. So that, that, that makes me feel good because I want to do this for a purpose, uh, not just, just to be doing it. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very pleased with that. So, um, <laughs> if you can't figure out how to end today's live, I'll stay on until you do. Okay. I'm going to try now. Okay. I'm going to try to, I, I have no screen. I, how the hell am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to log off when I don't have, I guess I could just, I think I can just, I wonder what happens if I do this. If I disappear right now, I'm going to try this now. I'm going to see what happens. Ready? Either I'm gone or I'll be here. Oh, son of a gun. Nothing works. What the devil? Control. I'm going to try out control. Delete. What the hell? Uh-oh. Cancel. That was control. Alt delete. Am I still, I'm still here. Okay. I came back. I did control alt delete. Oh my God. This is so weird. I'm just going to have to power off. Yeah. I'm going to have to power off. That's the only way I can get off. So <laughs> what the heck? What, what did StreamYard do to me anyway? I don't, I'm trapped in groundhog day. Yeah, I am. It's just, I've never seen this happen. And I absolutely have no clue. I, I've, I've made the screen smaller. I've made, try to make the thing wider. Nothing, absolutely nothing works. <laughs> so I'm going to do, I'm going to do that. I'm just going to have to just leave the show, leave the screen. And, uh, I, I want to see the way to wait. I want to see this one thing. It was Chris McDonough who Candace allowed to film inside the house. Oh, Chris McDonough. That, that, how do you say it? Dono? Dono? And when she refused to let Phil in, he just got permission from Chris to show his footage on his show. <laughs> yeah, I thought that she let Chris in was really bizarre. I was like, what the heck? See you later, everybody. I'm going to just disappear. <laughs> I don't know how else to do it. Hopefully this will never happen again. But I'm glad you're all still here. And you got. I'm most glad you got to see the reenactment. That was my main point for doing the show. So anyway, bye, everybody, and see you next time.
<laughs> so in other words, I just completely signed off of the internet. And then I came back in the stream yard and I came back with a normal screen. But I was afraid to do that before because I thought if I signed off of the internet, it would, you know, the stream yard would end. But it didn't work that way. So I got to come back. So now I know that in case I got some weird, weird issue with stream yard again, I know I can go off and come back and return. So now I'm going to go for the, <laughs> the official ending. Wait, do you see this? The official ending and I can actually sign off now. My God, what, what a nightmare. What in the heck? It's like the little gremlins. It's just uh, so amusing. So anyway, here's the official ending. Bye. <laughs>